Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, so, as you know that this is the 14th school, and I'm very happy to say that okay, this is a school which started here in 2010, and it has been going on for a long time. And so, you all of you, I mean, we have chosen you from a pool of applications from more than 200. So, so you should keep in mind that uh, attendance is uh, mandatory, not optional. So please try to attend all the lectures, okay? And so it's a two-week program, so okay, some courses will be hard, some courses will be distinct, but you will learn from all these courses. So it's a mandatory that you attend all the courses. It's not, you cannot, you don't have the option of choosing which course you want to attend and which course you don't want to attend, okay? So with that, I'll just uh, like to invite our director to say a few things. Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm not about to give you a lecture, but uh, so welcome to Raman Research Institute. Uh, many of you must have been here before, and uh, I'm particularly delighted that this school is being held here in the Platinum Jubilee year of uh, Raman Research Institute. As Sanjeev mentioned, that this is a very well-known school which has been going on for 14 years, right? And I understand the, you know, driving force behind it. Abhishek is here. He is at ICTS now, and Abhishek and uh, Sanjeev. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if anyone else is from ICTS, but I'm really very happy to see, uh, you know, ICTS and RRI join hands in uh, these, uh, you know, various activities that uh, we reach out to students. I should also mention that. Uh, there is a regular gravitational wave school which uh, ICTS were organizing, and I understand from this year, it's uh, again uh, probably borrowing from you or whichever way. It's called the Bangalore School on Gravitational Waves, and RRI is also participating in it. Uh, I mean, we don't have faculty to offer, but we have, uh, you know, uh, support that we have been providing to that. So similarly, uh, again. Uh, you know, Abhishek being a senior person at ICTS, I'd really invite uh, him to convey the message back to Rajesh and others that, you know, I think uh, RRI and possibly even ICTS gains by joining hands on as many opportunities. Uh, so I see a lot of young minds and, you know, many years back I have been sitting where you are sitting in schools, not, not statistical physics, obviously. Uh, but uh, I do, you know, want to emphasize what uh, Sanjeev said. You know, typically we, you know, build up prejudices very early, and we feel that, oh my god, that course is not really important, this is important, this is not. I mean, after your hairs have turned gray and all, you realize that, you know, you can really not predict. So it's good to be attending all the courses and try to get whatever you can. Okay, you should also appreciate the amount of effort that the lecturers are putting in uh, to bring this to you. Right, these schools are quite valuable and you'll find them valuable, if not now, I'm sure later in life if you're continuing in this uh, field. So with these words, uh, I'll again, Hopefully you'll have all a uh, great time here. Yeah, and if there are any issues with your stay and all, please let Sanjeev know. And I also welcome the lecturers uh, who've come here. Uh, and uh, you know, we're going to spend time here. I hope you'll enjoy our hospitality and you know, this will be a pleasant stay. Thank you very much.
So uh, unfortunately, we'll, uh, I mean, before, uh, I mean, those who are staying in the Jalahli guest house, so we'll, we are not able to provide breakfast there because of some logistic thing. Uh, so you have to come here, so, but today, Paul, it was a bit early, but from tomorrow, it will be, bus will start at 7.30, okay? Uh, so you can sleep for half an hour more. Uh, yeah, and then, okay, lunch uh, will be provided here, dinner will be also provided here, and then bus will leave around 8.15, um, so that you can have a good night's sleep. Uh, yeah, and I think today there are slightly fewer people because some of the people from the local uh, listing, they are not able to travel because there's a bunt here today, and that was also one of the reasons actually you were picked up early today. Okay, so from tomorrow there'll be more students. Yeah, and anything else you want to add? No, yeah. So, and if you have any problem, you can just uh, either catch Ovisek or me, or we also have support staff, so you can just uh, talk to someone about it. And I hope that, okay, you, all of you will gain a lot of things uh, from the school, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll also have tutorials. So we, the format of the school is basically, so we have three lectures, two lectures in the morning. So these are one and a half hour lectures. And then uh, as you see that there's a tutorial. Uh, so tutorial, usually we leave it open to the lecturers, how they want to conduct it. Uh, so this can be used uh, for, if you have any doubts, of course you can stop the lecturer in the middle. So this is, it's supposed to be, interactive and you can ask questions and if you don't ask questions then lecturer will ask you questions basically and but if you have some doubts even after the lecture so you can use the tutorial sessions to clarify your doubts uh, also depending on the lecture some lecturers might actually give you some problem during the lecture or leave something skip some details here and you are supposed to work it out okay and if you have some problem, then you can just ask the lecturers in the tutorial session. And so usually I think, so what we have found is that, uh, it's because since you don't have much time, right? You have like a three courses, it goes all the way to four, and then you have half an hour, then tutorial starts. So usually if you form a mini group of, let's say four or five students and discuss the problem among yourself, that actually works out better, and it also gives you a, it's an early start of this collaboration which you do later, right? So maybe you can, if you, if you stuck something, or like basically any problem, you have something, just form a group of four or five students and just discuss as a group, yeah. Is there anything else you want to add? Okay, I think it's just this way, okay. Herbert uh, Spoon uh, uh, giving this set of lectures. Uh, so uh, Herbert will talk about hydrodynamics of uh, uh, lattice gases. And uh, so I think we, we can start here. Thank you very much for this um, kind invitation here to the Raman Institute. I mean, I have been several times in Bangalore, but I don't think I have ever been at the Raman Institute, so I'm very happy to lecture here. 
Welcome, everyone. And so let me just put my name here. And I'm from, uh, from the Technical University in Munich. So is this somehow visible? I'm in this size, or okay? Okay, so I'm uh, one of these uh, old-fashioned people who still like to work on the blackboard. I mean, so most of my things um, uh, will be written here. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, you know, as mentioned already, I mean, you're perfectly welcome to ask questions during the lectures. And uh, you know, the more discussion, the, the better. And so, uh, so uh, the lectures which which I was. Uh, uh, planning uh, uh, is the hydrodynamics, and uh, I put uh, actually, you know, the, the full title would be to add the, the term stochastic, that is gases. And uh, since this is a, a school on on uh, statistical physics, uh, maybe and I have a lot of time. I mean, maybe you give me sort of a few moments to give sort of just a general broad overview, you know, where the, where this kind of topic is actually located. And uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, you know, it's all statistical physics, but very naturally, uh, statistical <laughs> physics. Uh, you have to tell me. You see, at some point, presumably, I'm going low, and then then you cannot see anymore. I mean, so. I'm trying to, okay, anyway. So, uh, so of course, you can uh, divide this into equilibrium and non-equilibrium. And so, so this, this will be static, and this will be dynamic. Okay, and the lectures, I mean, as you can see from the title, I mean, I talk about hydrodynamics, so it will be a dynamical problem which I'm going to study, so, so I'm sitting in this corner. Now, the first thing I want to sort of uh, remind you is that, you know, while, while this is a very traditional separation, actually it's not, not completely clear. You static just means that sort of, at least on a macroscopic scale, nothing is really moving. And uh, uh, of course you can also produce non-equilibrium situations where nothing is moving. I mean, these are the so-called, uh, I mean, we, we like to call them NES. I mean, so, so this is just a, a abbreviation for non-equilibrium steady states. And then, uh, of course, you know, it, it's very easy to, to generate them. I mean, for instance, I mean, sort of one of the canonical cases is that I'm sort of trying not, not to get too low, so let me put this picture up here. I mean, if imagine that, that you have a system and, and then the, you put one temperature over here, another temperature over here, and uh, if you make this temperature di different, I mean, then you will induce an energy flux. And of course, if you wait it long enough, and if you sort of make sure that, you know, these uh, reservoirs are actually correctly, you know, at given temperature, so, I mean, that of course you have to maintain, but you can maintain this over a long time, then you will, you will induce, and eventually it will come to a situation where on a macroscopic scale nothing is changing, but uh, 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 so, so you've reached a steady state. I mean, so you might think that, that you are in a static situation, but in order to figure out what that static state is, you have actually, you know, to solve some sort of dynamical equations. And so it's one of the, you know, sort of big miracle of statistical mechanics. And, and if you think about it, uh, of course, historically, uh, you know, I mean, I think, you know, th th this was uh, 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 an, an sort of a very important step is that uh, somehow when we look at, at the, the states which we call equilibrium, you don't have to worry about any dynamics. You know, once you say the system has for some reason reached a particular thermal equilibrium situation, not a NES, then you know, all what you have to do is you can more or less write down immediately you know, sort of some Gibbs formula, you can write down what, 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 are the, the, what is the formula for the state, or uh, so some, uh, some quantum mechanically, you know, sort of uh, thermal equilibrium density matrix, and then you can work and you don't have to worry about the dynamics at all. Okay. Anyway, so I'm, I'm in this situation over here, and uh, the next distinction which I would like to make is that um, uh, we can look at various systems. I mean, of course, uh, uh, you know, we, we can look at, at quantum, 
so, uh, so this basically means that, that you, have, you have a time evolution which is unitary. And we can also look at classical. Uh, so, you know, this, of course, Newton's equation of motion. So, so let me just call it deterministic dynamics. I mean, you know, dynamics which you obtain by, by solving uh, uh, deterministic evolution equations. So you, so you might think, I mean, what is specific about this uh, uh, distinction uh, in terms of statistical physics? Of course, the most important thing is that, that we want to understand I mean, you know, in particular here in this non-equilibrium situation, we want to understand this with, with random initial data. That sort of makes the statistical mechanics random initial data. Okay, these data could be either equilibrium, then of course we don't have to worry so much about the dynamics. We can study directly the state, or, you know, it really involves time evolution, and then of course we have to solve you know, either the unitary dynamics or the deterministic dynamics. Now, when you look at the, the history of uh, statistical physics, this is not really all. Of course, I mean, you know, this is what, what you teach your students, and, and I think it, it's certainly a very sensible way of making a distinction, and uh, depending on the situation, I mean, you know, typically, you know, you, you, in your course, you, you carefully divide, but, but clearly there are, you know, many systems which, uh, of course, Quantum theory is sort of more basic, but still there are many systems where the classical description is still valid, and, and so, so this is, but uh, what actually, you know, uh, a large part, uh, or let's say a substantial part of statistical physics is actually concerned with stochastic modeling, right? I mean, you know, if you, if you think about, you know, the way how we do statistical physics, of course, you know, this microscopic, I mean, this, uh, this underlying sort of atomistic or microscopic dynamics is, of course, very crucial framework in order to do the modeling. The modeling is not totally arbitrary. But very often, these problems are simply way too difficult, way too detailed, and we have to resort to sort of a more sort of, uh, you know, a, a somewhat more modest approach where we sort of guess a good statistical model, and then we analyze that model, okay? And so let me just call here as a third area, which is called, uh, which I just want to call stochastic models. They're, of course, not totally arbitrary at all, right? And, but uh, but uh, it's important, you know, that this is also part of statistical physics. Now, when you look at textbooks, I mean, most, most uh, textbooks, of course, you know, they, they are either concerned with this part or, or or equilibrium, or maybe non-equilibrium. But there, there's one textbook. In fact, I prepared um, a list of, of uh, literature. I mean, this we could at some point we can somehow put on the net, or I can show you. Uh, there, there's a very nice book by by uh, by Sid Redner and and two other co-authors. So let me just put you Sid Redner, uh, which is uh, it's really in a textbook, and it's called. Uh, statistical mechanics from a kinetic point of view. And so he emphasizes very much this kind of stochastic modeling and, and in a sort of, you know, textbook version explain many of the kind of things. And, and I, I think it's, it's, it's a very useful and, and I think uh, almost necessary book in order to sort of see that, that this part is uh, really an, an integral part of statistical mechanics. So from what I'm saying, you know, it's this part which, which I'm going to, to focus on, okay? Now, there are, uh, of course, a very famous example. I mean, so maybe I'll give you two examples of, of what, uh, of early examples of stochastic modeling. So, uh, so, so first of all, there, there's a famous uh, Einstein paper in 1905. Uh, on, uh, and and what, what he realized is that um, when you look at, at, uh, at the tracer particle in a fluid, uh, which people, you know, you know, could sort of actually, s at that, even at that time, they could see under the microscope. You see, it's sort of, uh, of course, it's a rather small, but if you magnify, I mean, then you can sort of, you know, it's somewhat larger than, than, than all the fluid particles and so you can actually see. And what you observe, of course, is sort of, it's actually, there is a book by Perron which, which sort of produces these figures. I mean, you know, it, it, it's quite amazing that, that you know, he, he, he sort of 
in the book he presents, I mean, you know, this trajectory which he has, he has seen under the microscope. And you see sort of like random trajectories and once in a while, I mean, there's a collision and, and uh, so, so, so these are pictures which he's drawing. And what Einstein understood is that, you know, th th these trajectories are sort of still complicated and you don't really know how to describe them. And he realized that, you know, modeling this as random walks and then sort of, you know, understanding that the random walk on large scales looks like Brownian motion, um, you know, he had a, a good statistical model in order to describe the system. Of course, it was extremely important for many reasons which I don't want to go into, and presumably you all know, but, but in any case, I just want to emphasize that there are famous examples of this modeling. Another uh, case which sort of came to my mind is uh, when you look at the Bohr atom, so you see, I mean, you have here maybe the energy and you have here sort of a few energy levels like this. And what Bohr was saying is that uh, once in a while, I mean, you know, the system just jumps maybe from, from, from this energy level to this one, or maybe, you know, it jumps down from this one over here, etc. right? Now, of course, maybe he didn't express it so clearly at the time, but that's, of course, a stochastic modeling. And in fact, you know, I mean, and nowadays, I mean, sometimes people sort of worry about our random number generators, and uh, people do use, I mean, even commercially do use sort of quantum mechanical effects to produce you know, even more perfect random number generators than what you could use otherwise. I mean, the usual thing is to take dynamical systems which sort of, you know, are chaotic and, and this sort of produces you for you sufficiently sort of quasi randomness, but uh, even this even more, okay? And so you see that, that um, you know, this, this idea of stochastic modeling is, is uh, you know, has a long history and is very much widespread. Now, uh, the main part of my lectures is that uh, you know, th this, or in my language, I mean, this would be one-body problems. Right. I mean, you know, it's uh, either this, this uh, energy transitions in an atom or, or maybe Brownian motion, or you can think of many other, you know, th there's, there's a whole <coughs> sort of area which, which is called stochastic thermodynamics, um, which looks at few problem, a few particles, uh, stochastic thermodynamics, and so, uh, uh, so, so this, this is fine. I mean, uh, uh, but uh, the, the, the sort of the focus of my lecture is that actually I want to study many body systems, okay? So, um, you know, these stochastic lattice gases are one example. So, uh, you know, just to give you a picture of, of, of what they look like is that, I mean, maybe you put some underlying lattice and then uh, on this lattice, I mean, you have sort of particles sitting, and they maybe maybe they can hop to neighboring sites, and of course they interact in the sense that uh, you know, I mean, this jump rate will depend on, on on what is the local environment, or maybe you can just put you know just the exclusion rule that you know, I mean, uh, the, if this particle wants to jump over here, it's not allowed, uh, something like that, okay. But the important thing is that it will be many body. And uh, uh, that sort of, you know, gives you an interesting insight of, of course, you know, also here on, on this side, I mean, you know, when we do statistical <coughs> mechanics, we have sort of many degrees of freedom in mind. And so, you know, also on this side, of course, you have always large systems. And, and uh, now I want to do the same thing um, you know, on the level of, of stochastic modeling. Now, of course, when you look, and presumably also at the later lectures, I mean, there will be many, many examples of these things and which are sort of all of a somewhat, you know, different uh, emphasis, uh, but uh, sort of <laughs> for my lecture, it will be sort of, th this is what I'm going to focus on, okay? All right, so, um, so maybe, maybe I, I should um, um, uh, sort of mention, uh, before going to this thing, just mention sort of two cases which, which I mean, just sort of tell you that, that this stochastic modeling is sort of quite widespread. I mean, so, so one obvious thing is, is uh, where you use this modeling is, is when, you look, when you look at colloidal suspensions. I mean, this is, so to speak, you know, the, the, the many particle problem of Einstein. Einstein, you know, if you have 
a very dilute density of these baser particles, and then you can essentially ignore the interaction, and then you can sort of handle it, you know, according to what Einstein told us. But if you now look at the colloidal suspension, you have many particles sitting in a fluid, and of course, then there will be important interaction effects. And so, I'm not going to, to study this system at all, but, but, you know, this would be one typical system where, where you, you really need a many body theory in order to understand what's going on. Another, another thing which, again, I don't want to study, I just sort of want to sort of, you know, two, two examples which came to my mind. I mean, so, uh, you can look at something which is, which is called active matter. You know, which of course is a, a whole area by itself, and I'm, I'm, I'm far from, you know, just, just observer. I, I don't know anything so much about this subject, but, but, uh, but the point is that, that you know, you, you look at, uh, you, you still, you look at, at many objects, but, but they, are, they are not just you know, sort, of, um, sort of particles, or, or like in this stochastic model, you know, where, where these, these particles which are jumping don't have any internal degrees of freedoms, but, uh, you know, the, I mean, active means that, that they are sort of content of objects, you know, which have their own energy, you know, the interaction between these objects are sort of, you know, very different from what we would learn from, from objects in, 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 in sort of more mechanical models. Uh, so here, I mean, you know, the, I mean, at least to me, the, the, the famous example are, are these bird flocks. So, you know, you, you have many birds which you can see on the sky and, and uh, you know, they form beautiful patterns and then you, won you wonder how, how, they are, how are these, where do these patterns actually come from? And uh, now if you sort of, you know, are interested and you want to do sort of make a, a a model of this, uh, of course, you know, you have many birds, but then, then the issue, how do you model the interaction between these birds? And then for this, typically, uh, you know, of course, again, you know, I mean, you, you have to insert rather special things. I mean, you cannot use just you know, a simple model like this, but, uh, but uh, it's again sort of an example of stochastic modeling, right? Okay, so let's see what else do I want to say here. Okay, so that's... Uh, I guess this part, okay. So, so now I, I told you a little bit, you know, uh, 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 sort of somehow in the direction which, which I will be going. And, and the next question is, um, you know, I mean, just like here we have unitary and we have sort of Newton's equation of motion. I mean, th th there must be also some guiding principle over here. And, and, and one of the guiding principle is that, that we want to uh, we want to use it, it's evolutions which are called Markovian. I mean, you know, for any real systems, I mean, this will be an approximation, presumably. I mean, just like, like in the Bohr atom, I mean, you know, when you, of course, Bohr just postulated as a phenomenological model, then later on people realized that if you couple uh, the atom to the quantized radiation field, I mean, then you can understand these kind of transitions on the basis of a more uh, uh, unitary model. Uh, and when you then start computing, you know, this transition and, and, and how long, you know, sort of the waiting times of these transitions, then uh, you realize that, that, you know, the true model, you know, would deviate from the Markovian model. But the Markovian model is, is something which is, uh, you know, very widely used and, uh, you know, it's, it's, just, it's a major simplification. So let me just... Uh, uh, say one, one word about this in generality. So, so, so what, what does Markovian mean? Well, okay, so you have, uh, you know, something uh, evolution, some evolution in time. It, it, uh, uh, a moment, so it's not, not really specified, but what, what you want to sort of do is that uh, you want to divide it. I mean, so, you know, imagine that here, up here, you have your states, which is sort of a little bit vague. I mean, this will become clearer later on. Anyway, so, so here you have this time, I mean, which I call now. And then you have the past, and then, then you have the future. Now, uh, if you think about mechanical systems, you know, if I give you the state now, then of course, you know, you, you can uh, put your unitary time evolution forwards in time, and you can put the unitary evolution always also backwards in time. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, once you have specified now, so to speak, the future and the past are actually determined. Now here, for stochastic system, this cannot be, because, you know, after all, 
you know, as I involve in time, there will be randomness, and so it's not determined. However, what happens is that if you if you condition if you condition on now, so condition just means that you're fixing, you know, the exact state at time t at this particular time, which I call now. Then uh, the past and the future is stochastically independent, so it has a product structure. Okay. So this means that, that, you know, whenever you want to do, you know, any kind of average and expectation in the future, you don't have to worry about the past anymore, given that I specified the now. No, past and future are independent. Okay, and, and this, this is, a, you know, when, when Bohr wrote down his model, I mean, you know, he, of course he didn't say it, but, 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 uh, you know, when you look at it and, and uh, with sort of with modern eyes, I mean, what he was saying is that, that you know, when, when you look at, at this point and you ask yourself, you know, how long will it take to make this transition, then uh, what he implicitly assumed is that you have a waiting time which is exponentially distributed, right? I mean, that's sort of, you know, radioactive decay. I mean, it's an exponential distribution. And uh, the, of course, it, it's not totally obvious, but when you sort of think about this a little bit more carefully, then you realize that this exponential distribution just means, you know, or, or can be translated into, into this kind of picture. It's, it's a Markovian assumption. If you take some other waiting time, it will be, which you could do, but, but, but then, of course, life becomes much more complicated. Then uh, uh, um, you will lose this, this particular Markov property. Okay? So, um, so, of course, I mean, you know, the kind of dynamics with, with which I'm using, I mean, they have names, so, so let me put them also here. I mean, so, so uh, in some cases, they are called Glauber dynamics. Um, I mean, just that you heard these names, I mean, I mean, I'm not doing something which is sort of very original here at that stage. It's the Kawasaki, but uh, um, Kawasaki. Um, uh, so, so, so this is typically Glauber dynamics is sort of used when there are no sort of extra conservation laws. The Kawasaki is used when there is a conservation law. So I will be mostly actually talking on this level because um, these, these particles are jumping and, and, and so the number of particles actually will be conserved. And, um, um, uh, um, but, but the point is that, that uh, and th th this will be explained uh, sort of uh, in great detail, is that, that um, you know, I sort of want to also study non-equilibrium situations like this one, right? I mean, so maybe, you know, global dynamics is very often understood only in terms of, of equilibrium dynamics, but um, so, so let me just put here, sort of, it's a non-equilibrium version of these things, right? Okay, very good, okay. And then one other thing which I have here in my notes, maybe, because, you know, Markovian, uh, so, so, so the models which I'm going to use and which is sort of, uh, you know, for theoretical purposes uh, convenient is that, uh, you know, the, the states, uh, so, you know, if I specify, you know, what, what is the, the, the complete actual state of the system, uh, they will be discrete, like, like you know, the, these sites which are either occupied or empty. And, uh, you know, maybe I have a huge number of them, but, but you know, it, it will be just sort of a, a discrete set. But um, uh, for, the, for the time, I'm still going to work with continuous time. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, it, it, it's a theoretical construction, but, but, you know, many of the computations that you do uh, would, would either be impossible or would be, become much more complicated if I don't use continuous time. And, of course, if you do numerical, simulations, which, you know, in many of these systems, uh, people, of course, have done and, and do nowadays, and uh, it's an important tool to understand, you know, beyond doing theory, it's a very important tool to understand such kind of uh, uh, stochastic models. Um, and then uh, on the computer, well, in principle, of course, you could also do continuous time, but, but this is sort of uh, typically a little bit sort of complicated, and so what people do is actually, you know, you also discretize time, and then it's sort of what people call a Markov chain. I mean, you know, chain just means that, that the state space, I mean, it's sort of, I'm, it's always, everything is discrete. Space is discrete and time is discrete, okay? So maybe maybe I should put this here, um, well, okay. It's 
Uh, it will come anyhow. All right, so any questions at that stage? Okay. Okay, so, so, so what, what, uh, what I'm going to do is, is um, I, will, I will first um, uh, sort of, you know, otherwise you cannot do any computation at all. I will sort of uh, uh, go a little bit into, into uh, you know, describing this kind of stochastic processes which are beh behind these models. And this I will just do with, uh, now maybe some of you have heard these kind of things, but nevertheless, I mean, let me do it anyhow. Um, uh, so I will first do this, uh, you know, in the case of of, uh, of, uh, of a finite state space, and give you some of the basic formulas. Uh, and um, um, once we have done that, then I will go, uh, you know, the way how it's constructed, that I will go into sort of various typical examples where, on one side, you know, there's some interesting theory behind, and also some interesting physical phenomena. Okay, so that's uh, somehow. And, uh, you know, rather than writing you down the list of what I'm going to do, I think that that's sort of just a waste of time. So, so let me just start right away with, with, with the first um, thing which I want to do, uh, which is chapter two already. Uh, and this, this, this uh, you know, I, I, I'm worried that, that everybody knows already, but, but you will see that I maybe emphasize things which, which are not so well known. Uh, Markov Trump processes. Okay, so this is a little bit probabilistic, and, and I guess uh, the first part, uh, let's see, uh, maybe I should say what I did in the second part. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay so, so, so there, are, there are two parts. I mean, so, so one, one, one of them is, is sort of just a general structure. Uh, and, and the second part will be, um, you know, I'm coming back to, to, to this distinction over here. I mean, once I'm on that leveling, uh, on the level of modeling, you know, you still would think that, that, you know, I should not have lost, you know, the distinction between equilibrium and non-equilibrium. And you will see that in, 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 in on the level of these Markov Chum processes, there's a very clear and, and simple distinction. And so this is sort of the, the second part of this, um, of this, of, uh, of this section. Okay, so what, what, what do I do? Well, I mean, first of all, I take a finite state space. So these are just uh, labels, I mean, so one, et cetera, all the way up to kappa. Okay, which I can think of some points here. I mean, this, and then they have some label, right? Okay, now, now eventually, uh, you see, we want to study systems of this type. And, and when, when, you, when you take, uh, uh, let's say, you, you, you take some volume, uh, some finite volume, uh, some box, let's say, which is, which is in the d-dimensional lattice. Okay, I mean, so, so some section like here. And then, then, then you ask you the number of states. I mean, you know, then I have, uh, I can, let's say I do the exclusion rule. I mean, then I have uh, either one particle or no particle. And so, so the number, so, so, so the kappa would be equal to, to the power of lambda, right? And uh, even if you make lambda rather small, I mean, this is a huge number, okay? So, you know, this is the many body problem. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I do as if it, it's a finite state space, that's fine. But, but eventually, you know, if, 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 if the number of states is as huge as this one, you, you have to sort of think about other strategies, right? But, but still, it's like telling the people, you know, you first do Newtonian dynamics sort of, you know, quite in general, but then later on, I mean, you have to do something else in order to deal with the, with the large number of particles, right? Okay, so let me first do this. And, and, and now, now the Markov jump process means that, that uh, you sort of uh, have jumps. Let's say you go from this one to this one, or maybe you go from this one to this one. And for, e for, for e each of these jumps, I mean, you, uh, you, uh, you specify a jump rate. Uh, so this is C from I to J. So, so this is directed, I mean, this is maybe I, and this is J. And uh, of course, you know, I will never sort of write this error, it's just sort of, a matrix if you want so 
uh, in a white BCI chain. Now, in order to uh, qualify as a jump weight, I should be positive. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes I include the zero, it's just for notation purpose. You see, there might be, there might be no, no jump possible from here to here. That just means that the weight is simply to zero, right? I mean, so that's uh, what I do. And um, now, uh, the, the point is that once I give you the jump weights, it's sort of like giving the Hamiltonian. Once I give you the jump weights, everything else is determined. And so I have to go through these few steps in order to tell you, you know, what, what is actually, in what sense this stochastic process is determined. So let's first make a picture of the, of the, of the evolution. So the evolution is, is quite simple, right? I mean, so you, so you have time t here, and, and maybe you start with, with some initial state. So, so this, this uh, okay, so I guess, uh, I mean, the, the, this, this set I call omega, just a set of states, and so, so, so here, here I have plotted, so to speak, the omega states, right? I mean, that, that's just, it's completely, uh, it's general, right? I mean, so, so uh, you know, it's it just, you know, the, the labeling is of no importance. I mean, I just have to, to give this, this label points. Okay, and so, so I start with some particular state, and then, then uh, I stay there for a certain time, but the main point is that this time will be now random. Okay, so, and, and, and uh, the, the all these random times, in order to have the Markov evolution, will be exponential. So we're going to write down the formula in a second, but, but the main point is that this is a random time. And then, uh, you know, it does a jump, I mean, to, to some other value over here, so it does uh, jump over here, and then you stay for another random time here, and then maybe you, you jump to this state, etc. right? So this is what is called Markov jump process. Okay, and now I have to tell you what the probabilities are. It's just sort of like, explaining to somebody, you know, throwing the dice, I mean, but what is it probabilistically, right? I mean, then you, you tell them, you sort of, you randomly pick a number between one and six, and then, then you repeat independently these kind of things. So, so I'm just doing exactly the same thing on that level, okay? All right, and so, so maybe, uh, maybe uh, in fact, uh, the omega might be not such a good thing. I mean, so, so let me call this sort of, you know, the x of t. I mean, it's sort of like a, a random trajectory, which, of course, is a, it stakes points in my space omega. The x of t is, is this curve here, um, uh, but you know, the values which this curve can take must be between one and kappa. Okay, so now, now let, let me do that. I mean, so, so first of all, I have to, to do the, the total weight ri, uh, which is the sum j equal one up to kappa uh, of the final points. And this, of course, is something which is well, I, let, let's see, I assume that this is larger than zero, so at least, at least one of the weights has to be different zero, otherwise I cannot jump it on. Okay, and then, then the waiting time, so let, let, let's say, let's say that th this is i here, state i, so this will be the waiting time, right? I mean, so just asking, you know, how long do I wait? And uh, this I do exponential, and uh, and the weight, of course, is r, is uh, is r i. So uh, so it's e to the minus r i times t. Now I can do a jump only if this happens to be positive. So let me put here uh, t larger or equal to zero. And uh, I, of course, later on I don't do it. But here, for the first thing I should do it is that. Um, you know, it's sort of a density, but it's a density relative to the what? Well, it's just the usual, usual uh, volume measure, so it's relative to dt. So when I do integrals, I mean, it's always this continuous time, okay? But now you see this is not quite right because, uh, you know, it has to be a probability distribution, so it has to be normalized to one. And so if I normalize this to one, I have to put, uh, I have to put the r in front, all right? So when I now do the integral from zero up to infinity, this will be equal to one. Okay, so now, now I know what happens, you know, for that period of time, and then uh, I'm just, you know, throwing an exponentially distributed random variable, and, and uh, whatever that particular value is, at that time I do the next jump. But now the question is, what will be the next jump? Okay, so, so this was one thing. And then, uh, then there must be a jump. So, so now, now this state is what I call J. This is where I jump to. And um, uh, well, I mean, the jump is, of course, according to these weights. But you see, these weights are not normalized. I mean, so I have to sort of first normalize 
by, 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 by the total weight, and so, so the jump will be one over Ri times C, uh, C of Ij. So, so, so to speak, the, 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 the normalized weight. You see, th this must be a probability distribution, and so uh, that's, of course, greater or equal to zero. And if I do the sum over, over if I do the, the sum over all J from one up to kappa, of this one over r i, uh, let's put it outside one over r i c i j. Uh, this is just equal to one, right? By construction, right? Because this sum is r i, and so I divide. So, so it's just a normalization. Okay. So th this this will be my jump probability, and then I just continue. I mean, so so now I have another exponential. It's all independent. I have another exponentially distributed random variable. And uh, you know, I wait f uh, a particular random time, and after I, I have this time, then, then I pick another random variable, all independently, which is now th takes these three values, and, and, and which is uh, which has these probabilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, and so uh, um, and let me just write down sort of one 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 formula for you that you can understand what how, how this works. I, I need this formula for another purpose. And so um, let me just write down this formula. So now I want to write down the formula for this for this uh, probability for for this uh, pass. But, but now, of course, the pass will have will have uh, many jumps. And so let me sort of uh, tell you how this works. I mean, so so I have i naught, which is my initial state. I mean, that's time zero, and this is maybe i n. So that's the final initial. And that's the final one. So I have I have n jumps. Uh, final I have n jumps altogether, and so uh, if I make now a plot, so I have here maybe my t1, and then I have here the t2, etc. Right, and, and now I have just to follow uh, this this kind of prescription. I mean, so so um, um, I, I I do the, the, the first jump from i zero to i one. That's I zero. Then comes the next state is I one. So, so they are completely arbitrary. But, but you see, it's a probability. So I have to divide it by one over I zero, right? That's the initial state. Okay. And now, 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 now I do the waiting time. So, so, so this this one is my waiting time. T is uh, T is T one. Uh, so I have R I zero e to the minus R I zero times uh, is zero times T1, that's the first one, okay? And now I just keep going. So, so this is the first jump, this is the first waiting time, second jump, etc. So the, the, last, the last thing in my formula, which, which I'm just not going to write out, everything in complete detail will be, will be uh, you know, the weight of N minus one, and then there will be the time Tn. And of course, you know, I have, to, I have uh, so to speak, uh, the a priori measure, which is given by this product of, of uh, the dt1 up to dtn. Okay, so here you just sort of copy this thing, and now you observe sort of a nice simplification. Namely, uh, you know you, you can simply cancel this, and so the actual formula which you write down for the, for the probability of a particular trajectory is actually simply this kind of multiplication. I take the weight from i0 to i1. Then I take this exponential factor, et cetera, et cetera. Then I have the weight here from i from from i n minus one to i n, and then uh, you know I have the weight of the final time. So, so the last time is here, was here was i n, and and this last step is t n. Okay. So now I've written down you for the probability, and the point is, is now everything is fixed, right? I mean so. So I've given you the weights, and in terms of the weights, I constructed this jump process, and that's all what I have. Uh, now, of course, you know, this is an extremely detailed information. I give you the probability of all possible paths. And that's something, you know, it's just like in statistical mechanics. I mean, if you, you know, I give you position of all particles, I mean, what do you do with it, right? So here you have lots of, even if I have a finite state space, I mean, you have sort of, you know, a huge number of possible paths, and so, so you know, which one to take? So clearly, you know, you, you, must, you, you must sort of get to some reduced description, which is something which you want to, 
maybe you know analyze and, and which contains your physical information. So, so uh, there is Jew's description. Okay, so this basically means um, you know you have some observables and and you want to compute expectation of these observables. I mean that that's sort of what what I roughly mean by reduced description, right? And so let me do one of the, one uh, one important observable, which people like to do in this context, um, which is um, which is the transition probability. So what is the transition probability? Well, I mean, you ask yourself, what is the probability uh, that uh, I start, let's say, in the state i at time t equals zero, so this is time here, and I, I arrive at state j at time t. This would be the transition probability, uh, average transition probability, So, which, of course, is a much reduced uh, information, right? And so what, what do I have to do for this? Well, I mean, you know, you, you, you have to do an average, and you have to do an average but but you have to man maintain you know sort of uh, um, uh, sort of you know the data which which are given here right I mean so in particular you want to have that the total times add up to to t I mean so you have a delta j equal one up to n t n should be equal to t okay and then you I'm not going to write out everything I mean you will have. Uh, the information that I start at i, I have the information that I start at j. So, so you have, so you want to, and then, then then you then you want to do a sum over many things, right? I mean, you want to, in particular, sum over n. So n is here the the the, the number of jumps. Um, um, and then, of course, you want to integrate over all these waiting times, and so so you know, it's an average of of this object here, <coughs> but it's sort of <coughs> restricted average over that uh, kind of constraints, right? And because this is all what you want to know, okay? So, so now this looks like a horrendous problem, which, which you don't really know how to do, but um, fortunately, and that's part of the Markov uh, properties, fortunately there, there's a simple formula how you can do that, and so let me just uh, explain this for you. So, so I have to, I first have to introduce uh, two matrices, so I call, I call L naught, no, I, I call, uh, let's see, how did I want to do that? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, okay, so, so I want to introduce uh, uh, two matrices. One is uh, a diagonal, uh, okay, I introduce a, a matrix L, okay. So it's a, it's a kappa cross kappa matrix, right? So in the case of system which I'm interested in, you know, there's of course a huge matrix, but uh, here we have just have a finite matrix, and so, so, so let me call this matrix L, and it's defined that by uh, the, the diagonal terms, I take minus the ri. The ri are the, these objects which I defined right over here. Okay. Uh, right, and then, then I want to take off diagonal matrix elements uh, lij, uh, which uh, are equal to uh, uh, the, the, the cij. Okay, so, so this matrix, uh, maybe I draw here. So on the diagonal, you have the minus Rj, and here the off diagonal, so you have the Cij. And, and uh, now, now uh, I want to sort of uh, give two names to this, so the diagonal part I want to call L0, and the off diagonal part I want to call L1. So, so, so the diagonal part is just sort of this matrix where I put all the matrix elements out here, zero, and, and along the diagonal, it's just the negative of the total weights. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the L1 are just uh, all the off diagonal matrix elements. I mean, these matrices, I mean, just those people who are, they're taught, you know, know about quantum mechanics, these matrices are not symmetric generically. Well, they're in some sense never symmetric because, uh, you know, it, it makes a difference whether I jump from I to J or from J to I. All right. All right, so now, now, now uh, once I have this, I mean, then I can do this uh, uh, complicated computation. And, and what I have to remind you is uh, something which um, one should know, but, uh, you know, uh, maybe you have forgotten already. Uh, so I want to compute uh, 
the exponential of this matrix, uh, so I want to compute e to the e to the L phi, and and I want to do this uh, in terms of um, uh, time-dependent perturbation series, in the sense that you know I I put uh, uh, the diagonal part upstairs, and uh, the off-diagonal part I put downstairs. Okay, and so so I write this as e to the L zero at time t uh, plus an integral from zero up to one, uh, yeah, zero up to t, dt one, and now I have e to the L zero t minus t one. So t one is what's speak the jump time, and then I have here the L one, and then I have e to the L zero t one, and I do, okay. So I sum over all n, it's an infinite sum, right? I mean, this corresponds to one sum, two sums, three sums, et cetera. So I can have arbitrary number of sums, so I have to take this infinite series, right? So this is what you call a, a time-dependent perturbation series in quantum mechanics. Yes, question? Uh, why do I assume, assume that? Well, I mean, uh, okay, you see, I, I, I want to, ah, so, so now I erase over it in important formula. Okay, so that sort of happens. But you see, I mean, in, in my formula, here, here, you, it's still standing. You know, in my formula, I have appearing e to the minus r i times t. And so, uh, so th th this is exactly the e to the l zero t, if you think about it, right? I mean, so this yeah. is why it appears. Yeah, so I was asking, does it put a constraint on the systems that you are modeling? Because it would mean that the system never stays in that state for like forever. Like it, no, because uh, it I kind mean, of assumes that uh, you cannot, I mean, there is no state from which the system does not jump away from. Like if you wait long enough, the system always changes. Uh, no, at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm not waiting at all. I mean, I'm just, I, you know, I, I just wanted to, to uh, uh, you know, as, as my first exercise, you know, in terms of reduced description, I just wanted to determine what is the probability to go from from state i to ti to state j in the time t. And uh, it's everything else will come later, but but uh, okay. I'm just doing this exercise for you. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So 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 let me just sort of finish the exercise. Maybe I can come back to your mm -hmm. question. So so first, I, I, I you know th this is just a complete algebraic identity. I mean, there's nothing deep behind it. I mean, so if I want to compute, so so, so the L maybe maybe I didn't say this. I mean, the L is of course L zero plus L one, right? All right. Okay. So so uh, so um, I have this infinite sum. Okay, I'm and then now, now 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 I compare it to to you know with the probability which I had, and, and you see that uh, when, when I really work out the, this matrix element, so, so now I want, want to take uh, of this thing the matrix element ij, and of this whole sum I also want to take the matrix element ij. And now when you look at this thing, I mean, you see that it's exactly this kind of thing which, 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 uh, which I wrote down. I mean, what I've written down here, you know, the, the, order, the nth term is simply uh, n terms, right? So, so let me just do this exercise. In the lowest case, I mean, you know, here it's L naught. I mean, just I take the matrix element IJ, uh, it's diagonal. And so, so here I just uh, have uh, no jump at all. I'm just sort of waiting. It's just E to the minus RJ times T, right? And then, uh, then, uh, uh, then, then you do the do the, the first jump. I mean, so so you know, things are properly normalized. I mean, this is what I told you already. So, so I verbally I omit this. I mean, so, uh, so, uh, so here is sort of your waiting time, uh, which is still remaining, and then, then uh, uh, you know, th this is the waiting time f for the first. Uh, okay, so what I'm plotting here is sort of you have a, a first jump from, from here. Uh, with, uh, so, so this is, this is uh, t, this is t1, and that's uh, t minus t1, right? And so, so I, maybe I should read from here. So, so, so first, uh, you know, I do the t1, and then, uh, then uh, you know, I, I do this transition, and well, like I said, actually, I wrote it from the in a different way, but it's not not important. I mean, so you can sort of figure out that I do the indices correct here, and uh, and, and and so you see, the, the this corresponds just to the first term, and then you do the second, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, 
And so you see that, that I get this nice formula that if I want to do the transition probability from I0 uh, to JT, then uh, this is nothing else but exponentiating that matrix, and then I have to take the IJ matrix elements. Okay. All right, so maybe that's something sort of which you have to think about a little bit uh, further, but, uh, but uh, you know, this, this is sort of part of the simplification of the Markov approximation that, um, you know, some of these, prob these probabilities, I mean, not, not all, you see, there are many other probabilities you could ask. I mean, you could ask, for instance, uh, I take a state I and I take a state J, how long do I have to wait until I first reach the state J, right? I mean, that, that would be a more, more complicated observer, I mean, more comp maybe not more complicated, but a different, maybe interesting information, and then I would have to rethink of how to actually do that, you see, but I have the basic formula, so, so from that, you know, everything somehow has to follow. In some cases, maybe the things are very difficult, I don't know how to do the computation, but, you know, at least in principle, you know, everything has to come from the sort of master formula which tells me what is the probability of, the, of particular trajectories, okay? All right, so, so now, now we have done uh, this thing, and so, so let me just sort of uh, um, uh, tell you a few things which you, which you can do with it. Um, uh, so, so first of all, I mean, what, what uh, I mean, the L is um, the backward generator. I mean, it's what called people the backward generator. Um, So, uh, so uh, well, then there must be another generator, which is the transpose of this, and this will be the forward generator. And so let me just explain you what is the difference. And, and the point is that, 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 that L is something which acts on observables, and LT is something which acts on probability distributions. And so since this is an important distinction, let me sort of explain this to you. So, so maybe, maybe, um, so, so maybe, maybe I have some some function on. Uh, so, so now I look at some observable. And uh, of course, you know, observable is sort of a somewhat vague meaning. It could be many things, but but here for that uh, instance, I mean, I'm thinking of of some function f, which is defined on omega, and let's say it takes real values, right? I mean, so it's just a function on my finite state space. And and maybe what 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 I would like to compute is I would like to compute um, uh, the average value of this function at time t. So, so, so xt is simply, you know, the position of my Markov jump process at that particular time t, which of course is a random quantity. I mean, it's sort of according to the randomness which I defined. So uh, I, I, I want to do the average over all paths, but uh, I want to sort of maintain one information, namely I want to maintain that at time t equals zero, I, st I start at i. So, so, so this is the starting point. Okay. Well, now, if you look at this, I mean, it's clear that, uh, you know, th this quantity I can express through this transition probability. So, uh, so, so I can, uh, so, so um, okay, so I have to go here. So this is equal to uh, the, the probability starting at i equal to zero, and then uh, going to the point j at time t. And at time two, I just do the average. I mean, so this is f, f of j, and then I'm doing this summation over j, one up to kappa, right? I mean, so once I know the transition probability, I can compute such expectations, but then you see that this is nothing else but e to the, I mean, because the transition probability is given by the, by the, um, um, uh, by the exponential of the backward, uh, you see that, that uh, you know, this is, I'm just inserting what I found over here, and then I'm explicitly doing the sum over j, and, um, um, so, so this, this, this is, uh, okay, this, this, this is a vector. So this is a matrix, and so I take the i's uh, uh, entry of this vector, right? So it's just linear algebra. Okay. All right, so, so this is, uh, now, now I can also look at, at, uh, at, uh, at um, uh, probabilities. Oh, maybe I put a little bit more space here. I can look at probabilities. So, for instance, I can uh, say, okay, I have some probability at time t equals zero. So I give myself uh, 
the probability distribution at the initial time. So I have, uh, I have uh, my initial uh, probability, I call this Bo i. So this just, just tells me that, you know, I, I start initially not at the fixed state, which was sort of the point over here, but I imagine that I have some, some probability distribution. I, so th this, of course, are, are, are probabilities. So I, uh, has to be equal to one. Okay, and then the question is, what is uh, the probability distribution at time t, right? So that's maybe something which I want to know. And, and of course, you know, that, that's again now easy to do. I mean, so this is the Voce uh, at time t, uh, yeah, at time t. Uh, well, I mean, this is just the summation uh, of, uh, of i going from one up to kappa. And then I have here my initial probability distribution, which was the i. Then I use the transition probability, which just goes from i zero uh, up to jt. And that's already the answer, right? I mean, so, uh, you know, as function of j, I mean, this, this will be a probability. And so this is just nothing else but the probability distribution at time t. And so you see, in terms of this generator, I can write this as e to the lt. But now I have to be a little bit careful. Namely, you know, it, it's i j, and then I have the rho i sitting over here. And it's the summation i over 1 up to kappa. And so you see it's more convenient to define the transpose because, you know, I'm sort of acting backwards on this one. And if I would do the transpose, then, then I'm interchanging these two matrix elements. Then I get the forward. And so I can write this as e to the transpose of t of a. Um, okay. So uh, this is this fine distinction between uh, L and its transpose. The transpose is acting on probability distribution. And, uh, and, and the L itself is acting on observables. Now, once I have that, I can, I can, write, down, I can write down what people call the master equations. You see, I just have to solve a linear evolution equation. I mean, so I have DDT of my observable. is nothing else but L acting on F. And if I... I mean, this is a time t. Uh, okay, okay. This is a time t, and this is a time t. So I just have to solve this linear evolution problem, and uh, and if I want to do the 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 the, um, um, the probability distribution, then I have to take the transpose, and I get this thing. And so let me uh, let me write out uh, you know this this one in in full glory, so that you can see that uh, I'm just doing you know what everybody else is doing also. But uh, but uh, maybe you know people sort of do it more upside down. So if if I do uh, if I just write out exactly what what this transpose is, then you see that I have here the C, but now it, it's sort of inverted. I mean J I, and then I have to act on rho J minus, and then it's C I J, and then I have to act on rho J, right? And so you see, it, it, it's this, I mean, here it doesn't make any, I mean, here, since, since it's just sort of, you know, I'm do, doing the sum over this, uh, uh, sorry, this is, uh, no, this, this is row i, okay. Okay, so you see, I'm, 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 I'm here, I'm just summing over this, I mean, then it doesn't make sort of, uh, anyway, so, so th this is what the formula is, but the, the important point is that, that I have to do this transposition here. and. Uh, if you look at, at the many-body system, it's you know even doing this, this, this uh, working out what 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 the LT is might be actually quite complicated. And so when you do computations, and I will show you very soon sort of examples of that. Uh, when you do computation, you will see that that it's 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 much better to actually um, use uh, the backward generator. And why is it so much better? Because you see here, I, I had already difficulties of writing it down, and, and um, you know I have to be careful with doing these matrix elements. But if you write down the, the evolution equation for the, ah, maybe maybe uh, you know I should just sort of let people follow what I can say. I mean, you see, this is this is usually called the gain term. So these are all the transitions from J into the state I, and this sort of uh, the loss term. 
and you know, very often people sort of write down this as, as the basic definition, but th that's very misleading. I mean, the basic definition is what I told you at the beginning. I mean, I, you know, I, I wait in a particular state for an exponential time, then I jump, and then I wait, and all these processes are called to sort of independent, but prescribed uh, probabilities once, you give, once I give you the, the weights. But when you look, actually work out what is the DDT of, uh, when, you, when you work out this formula here, then you see that the L acting on F is, is a very simple formula. It's J equal one up to kappa, and then you have F, uh, sorry, then you have your, your transition weight, Cij, and now what you have to do is you have to just take F at the, f at, um, at, at the state uh, Xj, and then you have to sub, so, so it's, this, is, this is the final state, so, so this is the final one after the jump, right? And you have to subtract from it what was the initial state. That's the uh, initial state. Okay. And you see, this is, this is sort of computationally, I mean, you will see this in, in examples which, which are going to come. I mean, this is computational, this, this is, uh, I'm summing over J, so, so this is Fi. Okay. So, uh, so th th this kind of formulation sort of is computationally easier because, uh, you know, all what you have to do is you, you write down your weight and then you figure out what is that particular observable you're looking at at the final state and you subtract it from what is the initial state. All right, so and this is what I wanted to say on this part. Okay, and so, so now let me sort of close the generality. Uh, excuse me? Yes. So the evolution operator of uh, the row of i of function of t, uh, that must be uh, exponential to the power LT, LT transpose. Yeah, so, 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 so rho uh, i uh, at time t is, is, well, okay, I wrote down this formula yeah. up here. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. that's right. That yeah. should be t, uh, L transpose or just L? No, this is, this is L transpose. You see, you see, I mean, the, the probability is go, yeah, it's because of this inversion here. The, 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 that's okay. why it has to be transpose. Okay, okay, okay. You see, when, when you write down sort of the, 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 the naive master equation, which, which you teach your students, then uh, you, you start with this formula. I mean, you're saying that, okay, I, you know, I, I have to look at, but I, you know, I'm in the state I, I have to look at from, from where I gain and where I lose, right? I mean, but, but you see, I, here's Ji and here's Ij. I see. Uh -huh. So this is why it's, why it's, uh, why it's the transpose. I will, I will, later on I will always work with the L itself, right, because it's just much easier. But it, it's fine, you know, I mean, it's just sort of, just a um, question of, of what you're used to, right, I mean, but, but uh, you will see that, that, uh, that, that, that the, the backward is sort of the simpler object. There's another question. What, what, ah, okay, okay, yeah, okay, sorry, but this is too small. Yeah, I realized when writing, okay. So, so this, this I would call is sort of after the jump, I mean the final, well, let me write before. No, so this is after the jump. And this is before. Yeah. I mean, you see, I'm doing a jump from I to J, so this is the state which is sort of after the jump, and this is before, uh, before this state. Okay, I am trying to, yes. Good, I'm trying to write larger, okay. So now we come already to the, to the last part of this um, section, namely, uh, I want to tell you something about the long time behavior, which is very simple actually. So, so one of the things, you know, I talked about steady states, I mean, maybe, uh, you know, on that description, maybe I want to understand what's going on for long times. Now, uh, this is sort of quite simple, actually. So, so this is my space omega of states. And now I divide it into classes of points or of states which are connected by a transition, so with, with non-zero transitions. And so this means that, you know, I'm I taking little sections out of this thing, and then I call this omega one. And so omega one means that if I start with a state here, then, you know, I can reach any other state through a sequence of, of you know, positive probabilities, okay? But, uh, uh, you know,
know, this is sort of maximal. I mean, you know, if I stayed, it, it stays always there. I can do, cannot jump over here. So I can clearly partition my omega into, into these subsets. Now, uh, you know, I mean, very often application, maybe you can reach any other state, but then you see you have a conservation law, then maybe the number of particles is conserved, and then you automatically have this such kind of a partition, right? And then, then the assertion is that, that um, if, if, if I'm in, in, in one of these uh, partitions, I mean, then, uh, you know, if I wait long enough, eventually the system will reach a stationary probability distribution. So, so, so I'm, now I'm thinking in terms of probability distribution, let's say solving this system. And then you see that, that you know, when, when you look at these matrices, I, I don't want to go into details here, is that, you know, eventually you're going to reach some steady state. Okay. Now, of course, the, the steady state, you know, so, so um, okay, so let me see, what, what did I want to say here? Okay, so, so, so I have sort of the components Um, uh, omega L, I mean, so these are this, this omega one, et cetera, right? And then in uh, omega L, uh, th there's a unique steady state and because I'm in a finite system, you have exponential convergence, right? I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, you, one thing, one way to think about it is sort of purely algebraically. You see, basically what I'm saying is that, that uh, you know, this, 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 uh, this L, so, so this is my L matrix. Uh, I'm just saying that, that you know, that this sort of has, has, has a block structure. I mean, this is one thing. You see, there are no, no transition rates between other ones. I mean, so, so, so these things are then sort of zero, right? I mean, so I have maybe a block structure like this, zero, and everywhere else is sort of zero just means that, you know, I, I, I collected all the states which are connected sort of into this block, and then I have maybe another one which are connected in this block, another one which are connected in this block. And then, you know, if I, if I take the exponential of, the, uh, you know, if I take e to the LT, then of course out here, you know, there's nothing happening, but, but here I, I get sort of the corresponding evolution terms. And so then I'm saying that if I'm looking, you know, at this little part of your matrix, and if I'm waiting long enough, eventually, you know, it, it, it will converge, and then, but, it, but, uh, but it will converge to a unique steady state. And of course, the same thing is true for all the other blocks. And the reason why I wanted to emphasize this is that I just want to point out that, you know, when you ask the same question for, for let's say, the systems which I sort of wrote down at the beginning, like, you know, unitary quantum dynamics or classical mechanics, you know, the, the question of convergence to something to steady state is, is, is a much, much more difficult question. I mean, in fact, you know, a question which to some extent is still completely open, right? I mean, of course, em empirically, you know, you, you might observe that, that uh, you know, if I wait long enough, I mean, nothing is happening. But then going back to a microscopic model and understanding whether this is actually reflected by the microscopic model is typically a very difficult question. I mean, you now you have to understand chaos, or, you know, you have to understand random matrices. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an ongoing problem, and, and of course, there are many results, but, but you know, everybody agrees that, that uh, you know, that there's no simple general result like the one over here. So this is one advantage of the stochastic modeling that this, you know, is sort of usually considered as a very difficult problem actually can be solved uh, uh, quite simply. Now, you see, I, I have not, it, it's just an existence here. I have not told you what is, what is, um, <laughs> I have not told you, told you what is the steady state. I mean, all what you know is the steady state must be, uh, you know, because it's not changing in time, must be a zero eigenvector of, of the transpose matrix. Okay, so you see, if I, if I still want to know, so okay, fine, you converge, but what is it? I mean, at least on that level, you still have to solve an algebraic problem. I mean, you have to, a matrix which could be big, and you have to sort of determine what is, what is, uh, you know, a zero eigenvector of this matrix. And in, in the context of concrete problems, I will come back to this. I, I don't want to do this, at, you know, more generality, yes. Yeah, so in the last equation on this side, uh, what do you mean by fi? F is the observer, right? Uh, okay, so maybe, 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 maybe my, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so here I see that my notation is maybe a little bit uh, bad, okay. 
I use this definition up here. I mean, so, so uh, I, I think I should have written this. Uh, it's a good point, yeah. I sort of should switch my notation a little bit uh, to make it uh, uncomprehensible. So that's I. Okay, that's after the jump J, and this is I. So uh, yeah, th this is a good point. Okay. Yeah, but, but what is meant by FI? FI is the. Well, it's just, 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 just uh, you know, the function. So, so this is a. F I think, think of this sort of. I mean, you know, if you think algebraically, this is your matrix, and, and FJ is sort of a vector. Now, I'm looking at this evolution equation, so all the things, of course, are functions of T, right? I'm just, just writing a, a matrix equation, d dt of psi of t is equal to a psi of t, right? A is a linear operator acting on psi, and, and I solve this uh, linear equation, and the solution is e to the a t. It's just sort of my notation so that you understand what I'm saying. Uh, I mean, if I don't put an index here, then it would be that function at time t equals zero. Right, I mean, so, so, so this is sort of the generic setup, right? I just have a linear ex evolution equation and uh, which has, has this kind of evolution. And, and uh, of course, the initial data are not, not given here. So, so uh, you know, okay, so, so I, if I, okay, so, so maybe I should write psi of zero is equal to psi. I mean, this is known. And then the unique solution of this equation will be this one here, right? And so, so, so I've just written down the same thing over here, just, I've written it out in components. I'm mean, fi is sort of, you know, the, the ith component of that vector, and here's the linear operator acting on fi, and that is sort of what you have. No? Yeah, I just, okay, I just don't know what is meant by the vector. So what is the vector f? Well, I mean, uh, f is my observable. I mean, so you see, uh, where did I put it? Uh, well, maybe it's already gone. Okay, so, so so I can just repeat it. I mean, so so I take some function f. Which, which goes from omega to r, right? And so this function is uh, f1, et cetera, all the way up to f kappa, right? I mean, so, so, so this observable, because I'm working on a discrete space space, these observables are simply represented by kappa vectors. Is that fine? Okay, more questions, yes? Okay, so, so of course I haven't told you, but, but you see basically, okay, so basically what I'm trying to tell you is that, that uh, um, um, uh, I have, uh, okay, so, so, so this is something which, which goes under the name of Perrin Frobenius, Serum Frobenius, Fro, 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 uh, I don't even know how to spell him, okay. I mean, so, so basically, you know, once I'm in, 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 uh, in, in such a, uh, so, so, of course, I, I might have a lot of zeros, but uh, let, let's look at one block and, and let me forget about L or so, let, let me just sort of think of this one block and let me call this matrix A. And then you have a matrix A with the property that AIJ, um, uh, you see, I'm, 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 I'm reaching, I, I, the decision is that, that I can, uh, uh, reach any state from any other state through this matrix A. I mean, so this means that, that A to the N, uh, maybe with a large N, IJ must be strictly positive. I mean, this just means that, you know, I mean, if I'm applying this A sufficiently often, I mean, then eventually, you know, I will, will sort of reach any other point. And then uh, what Perrin Frobenius tells you is that, that uh, uh, such a matrix, you know, doesn't have to be symmetric. I mean, any such matrix will, will have eigenvalues uh, so it's, 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 you know, it, it, it is a matrix, okay, uh, it, it, okay, so, so, uh, yeah, okay, so the Perrin Frobenius tells you that, 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 uh, you know, asymptotically, okay, so, so, okay, so how should I say this, um, okay, so, so you, you have one, one, uh, one additional information, you know, it's not just a general matrix, but you see it, it, it comes, you know, it's, it's a generator of, 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 uh, of, um, of this Markov evolution, so when, when you look when you look at, at these matrix elements, um, okay, so okay, I, I'm I'm not going to, to give a sort of complete explanation, but but what I want to say is that that this theorem tells you that um, uh, so when you look now at the spectrum of the eigenvalues of this matrix, okay, I, my assumptions, I mean. For the purpose of this discussion, are, are not complete. But I mean, let's just let us tell you what 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 the final observation is. If I look at the eigenvalues, then 
Of course, they can be in the complex plane, but the, the assertion is that when I look at such an operator, then I will have one eigenvalue, which is um, uh, which is is one, and then uh, you have um, sort of other eigenvalues which are sitting over here, and it's uh, you know if I do it many times, I mean then uh, then uh, it's this eigenvalue which actually dominates, and so that gives you the exponential inverse. Maybe m maybe I, I can explain you a little bit more detail. I mean I'm I'm not giving a sort of perfect good explanation at the moment, right? But but this this is what happens. Uh, why, why, why do I have to make such division? Yeah. Well, because, because you see, this part doesn't talk to this one. So, so clearly, you know, if, I just, uh, if I'm taking a general case, then uh, uh, I will not have a unique probability distribution, right? Because, you know, if I start something which is concentrated over he here and over here, then, uh, you know, they don't talk to each other. So, so, so how could they equilibrate, so to speak? Right? I mean, you see all the states which I'm doing, they are moving in this direction, but they never go here, right? And so, so the, the general case is that, that I have to really make this subdivision. And so physically, you know, the way you should think about it is that in the case of the stochastic lattice gases, there I have the number of particles which are conserved. So once I fix the number of particles, which is means that I'm sitting in one of these omegas, then, you know, everything sort of equilibrates. But, the, but if I take another number of particles, you know, they just don't talk to each other. It's just sort of another, another, uh, it's another initial condition, right? Okay, so let's see, I have to look on my watch here. Okay, so where are we? Uh, okay, so, so, so now, now, um, now uh, I think uh, I still have sort of, uh, 50 minutes, I mean, that should be sort of okay uh, to uh, sort of explain you one, one other small thing, namely, uh, what is, what is, uh, uh, just since I emphasize this so much, and, and, uh, and maybe I should try to make this distinction, I mean, so what, what, why, what do you, in, in this context, what, what do you mean by equilibrium, right? I mean, so this is 2.2. Okay, so a priori, this is not so totally obvious, you know, if you sort of come from this sort of somewhat more general framework. But uh, in the community, I mean, there, there's, there's a complete consensus of how to do it. And so, so, so let me explain this to you. And so, so let me, uh, so, so now I have, uh, now I use now the letter X of T. This is sort of my, this is my, my jump process. I mean, the one which I just explained. So it's it's a probability distribution on trajectories. I mean, this is why I call X of T, and they take values in the states one up to kappa, right? I mean, so that that sort of that's the object which I try to explain you a little bit. And now you want to say, you know, when is this system in equilibrium? Okay, and 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 uh, uh, the traditional answer which which you, you which you want to use. Is so um, uh, you see, yeah, I have at, at that point it's rather general, and I have not distinguished between, let's say, physically between position and velocities, right? I mean, that, that's something which, which is an extra point which I don't want to discuss here because, of, you know, in the models which I'm going to look at, in some sense, you only have positional variables, okay? And so, so I mean, of course, that's an important thing, but but it would be, you know, sort of leading us uh, too far astray. And so, 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 what what I want to what I want to uh, emphasize is that um, I want to I want to claim that time reversibility is equal. To uh, equilibrium, uh, to equilibrium, 
Well, uh, it's, it's equal to equilibrium. I mean, let, let, let me maybe put it this way here. And then there will be a, a mathematical definition which, which uh, comes from this time reversibility. So basically, what one is saying is that, that I, I prepare the system and if I, if I see that this system sort of is, you know, if I run the movie forwards in time and if I run the movie backwards in time, I would not be able to distinguish statistically, right? So one elementary thing is that, that uh, you know, you must have, you know, if I look at the single time over here and there's some other time over here, you must have the same probability distribution, okay. So basically what I'm trying to say is I have this X of T Trump process and then I have uh, steady state Um, which uh, I just call rho. I mean, so, so, so the L transposed on rho uh, must, uh, you know, must be uh, a zero vector of this, um, must be a zero solution of, of, uh, of, of, of this equation over here. So L must be equal to zero. And at the moment, I'm assuming that, that everything is connected. So, uh, so, you know, once I give you the base, I mean, there's a unique rho which satisfies this condition. Okay, and now, now you want to impose this reversibility and uh, uh, let, let me just write it down, down so that you understand what I want to say by this is that um, uh, I'm, I'm computing the probability of a trajectory, let's say between zero and t. Huh? So I'm not going to write down this probability but I have told you what the construction would be. And now I want to say that, that so, you know, I, I, I see a particular trajectory. And now I want to say that if I time reverse the trajectory, I say the same probability. So what is the time reverse trajectory? Well, I mean, that's sort of quite clear, right? I mean, I have singled out a time window from silver up to capital T, and then so maybe I have a jump uh, process which is going this way, right? Uh, now yeah, I just run it backwards. Okay, and... Um, this is the probability of uh, the x. Well, the running backwards means that I look at t minus t. Uh, and again, I mean, the I mean, you know, this, this curly bracket means that I'm really looking at, at, at one particular trajectory, right? I mean, one given curve. This is sort of what is time reversibility. Okay, so now, I, I, you know, now, now there are steps in between which, which, which I cannot sort of explain further, but, uh, but when, when once you have this definition, th then you see that th this is mathematically equivalent to what people call detailed balance. And that, that's sort of easier. Uh, I mean, I don't have to sort of make arguments in between, but, but uh, you know, I want to emphasize that, that uh, you know, the initial definition, what we call equilibrium, is sort of a rather natural definition, right? I mean, if I do a non-equilibrium steady state, I mean, this kind of thing would be, uh, would be not satisfied because there are carbons in the system, and you know, if I reverse them, typically the carbons would also reverse them. So then, you know, this would single out the time direction. But if I do the ordinary equilibrium, then, uh, you know, it just doesn't single out whether I'm going backwards or forwards in time. Okay, and um, uh, so when, when, you, when you see that, um, Detailed balance, I mean, it have sort of physically slightly more intuitive uh, notation. I mean, uh, I, you see it's a probability and so, so and it, it's, it's everywhere, it's, it's positive. I mean, because I have this uniqueness and so, so uh, I can write this as e to the, like, like a Boltzmann factor, e to the minus epsilon of j. And, and, and I call this energies. I mean, this is a sort of, you know, useful for a physicist to, to think in terms of energies rather than necessarily these probabilities, right? I mean, but, uh, you, know, it, 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 you know, it's just, I mean, the, the epsilon j is minus the logarithm of that row of j, right? It, it's it's, it's not, not, not so deep, but it's just sort of convenient to write down the formula. And then, uh, then the, the detailed balance tells you that um, if, I, if, I, if I do a transition from i to j, Okay, so, so the naive uh, conjecture would be that detail, you know, it's time reversible. So maybe, you know, if I interchange i and j, this is just the same. But that, that's, of course, too naive. I mean, this is sort of not really what it works. But, but the, the picture is that, that uh, in terms of energy, I mean, that's sort of the more familiar picture. Maybe I have here another and then here I have another energy. So I'm sitting in here and, you know, I'm, uh, so this is my state i here and that's my state j. And I'm looking at transitions between those. And um, of course, you know, the rates will be very different. 
But if I weight the weights with, with, uh, with um, what is the probability to be in that state, then you know, this identity must make sense. And uh, this is sort of uh, what is implied here by this thing. And so the correct definition is that I have to weight the initial state by rho i. And then if I interchange, of course, here I get the rho j. So this is the detailed balance condition. Okay, and if you want to, to write it sort of a little bit uh, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a more physical way, I mean, then, then you know, typically you would say that the, the, the Cij, now, now you, you, know, you, you, you bring this, so to speak, to the, to the other side, and then it looks like an energy difference. So this is E to the minus <coughs> the epsilon J minus epsilon I, and then I have here... Um, Okay, so this means that, that uh, the weight from I to J is related to the weight from J to I through this uh, uh, exponential of energy differences. Okay, and that sort of, in, in that form, this sort of generalizes to, to, to many sort of uh, quantities of physical interest. Right? And, um, uh, well, I mean, uh, so, uh, um, uh, you see, I mean, when you, when, 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 uh, when, when you look at this formula, I mean, then, then, then you see that this implies, I mean, you know, you just have to, this is one of these exercises which you have to do is that once I impose this detailed balance condition, that implies that the L transpose acting on rho is equal to zero, right? I mean, so this is sort of, you know, this is, this is what we wanted to have, is to sort of, you know, a check where, where when once we, we impose this condition that in particular we can deduce that, that uh, you know, this, this rho j is actually uh, the steady state. Uh, right, and so now, now the, why is this important? Um, well, uh, you know, th this, Um, okay, so, so um, I mean, one, uh, one reason why this is important is that um, it allows you actually uh, uh, to realize that um, when you look at, at, at the eigenvalues of L under the detailed balance condition, then all the eigenvalues are actually real eigenvalues and on the negative axis. So let me, I think this is sort of the last thing uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, yes? So the, 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 the statement of time to universe, uh, time universe will be uh, at the part, and then you have to pay attention. So the experience of this is, uh, as if uh, you try some words, right? Well, I mean, it's it's I, I don't think it's, it's uh, I mean, you have to do a little bit of thinking, yeah, but, but I, I, I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's not trivial. It is, I, I would not, you know, if you would ask me sort of just immediately sort of write it down on the blackboard, it, it, it's sort of, you have to do a little bit of thinking, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's like always with these problems, I mean, somehow, you know, if you have the right way of thinking about it, I mean, and, and then that doesn't, it's, it's not so difficult, but yeah, no, no, but it, it, it's somewhat deeper, deeper result. Actually, it's something which, which was first moved by Kolmogorov. I mean, Kolmogorov is the one who sort of understood that uh, maybe more in the context of, of um, sort of more uh, diffusion processes, I mean, not some processes, but, but uh, you know, in some sense, of course, it was understood that, uh, you know, the same thing is true for some processes. Yeah, this is a somewhat deeper result, yeah. Okay, so let me, let me sort of end with the with, uh, last thing, and then I can take this up next time. So, so L is uh, a symmetric matrix. So that's nice, I mean, so it has eigenvalues, which I, uh, but this, is, this is not another complete sentence, but I mean, let me just say that uh, what we know about the spectrum, so, you know, under this uniqueness condition, we have an eigenvalue zero, so, so this is sort of unique. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, and then, then, uh, then all the other eigenvalues are here on the negative real axis, right? I mean, so this is what we know, uh, sort of incomplete generality. 
And uh, now the, the point is that, um, as I emphasized already, it cannot be a symmetric matrix as written. But the point is it's a symmetric matrix in a weighted Well, I use Hilbert, but I mean, you know, it's just sort of a linear space here, uh, finite dimensional space, and a linear Hilbert space. And so what I mean by, by this weighted space is that, that uh, you see, I mean, so, so usually we have the unweighted space. I mean, let's say F, G uh, would be the summation J equal one up to kappa of, I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, in this business, I'm never really looking at, at <coughs> complex spaces because our observables are real and L is sort of a real matrix, so let me not worry about this. I mean, that's F, J, G, J. I mean, this would be the usual scalar product between uh, two uh, kappa vectors, F and J, right? Now, with respect to this, uh, with respect to this um, product, clearly L is not symmetric. I mean, just sort of, I make the first example and it's clear because, you know, I emphasize the I to J is sort of different from J to I, so it cannot be symmetric. However, I do a little thing. I mean, you know, the, the, the question is why, why this particular scalar product? I could take any other scalar product, but there's one natural scalar product, which, which I denote by, uh, by F, uh, G, and then I put here an index row, which I call the weighted one. I mean, so, uh, so this is J equal one up to kappa. And now, so, so rho is, is a positive weight, right? I mean, because it's, it's a probability distribution which is strictly positive. So, so I weight all the states with rho j, and then I put here f j, g j. That's just another scalar product. Right? However, when you, when you write out, I mean, so that's another exercise which we can do this afternoon. When, 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 when I write out um, uh, the detailed balance condition, then you see the following identity. Now, it's not the flat space, it's, it's the weighted space, and that gives you uh, LF. Okay. And you, if you just work out the matrix elements, you see that it's, that's exactly, that's exactly the detailed balance, it's just, it's just exactly the detailed balance condition as over here. Okay. And so this means that um, in this weighted space, uh, you know, the, the, the L is indeed symmetric, right? I mean, if I take the branch with respect to rho, then, you know, it will be just to L itself. Now, once, once I have this identity from this sort of, you know, just sort of standard linear algebra, which, which uh, certainly I don't have to go into, uh, you know, it will tell you that, that uh, when I look then at the spectrum of L, I mean, uh, of course, you see L will have, in the flat space, it will have left and right eigenvectors, I mean, because I'm working in the flat space. And when I do a computation, typically, maybe I don't want to involve the row, I mean, so, but I just want to do, so to speak, in the, f you know, the, this is the flat space. I mean, I just want to do, you know, I just want to look at eigenvalues of the type L psi is equal to lambda L psi, right? I mean, that, of course, you know, will we'll have left and right eigenvectors. I mean, that's something which is unavoidable. But uh, but uh, because because of the symmetry, I still know that the eigenvalues lambda will have the structure as indicated uh, over here. Sorry, this is this is too much. Okay. All right, but the structure is, is indicated over here, and then you know since since there are only finite number of eigenvalues, I mean there must be have a spectral gap, and you can see from this information that you know will converge exponentially to the. Equilibrium state. Yes. Is it possible to say, or you know, without diagonalizing the matrix, whether the steady st whether the steady state will satisfy detailed balance or not? Uh, you mean if if you what, you you give me L and then then you want to know whether uh, it will give detailed balance or not in steady state? Uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, well, I I, I think I think. Um, uh, okay, that's a good question. Well, uh, okay, so 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 uh, you see, uh, you know, I have no. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, you you have a okay. So, um, so uh, you know, you have a very precise condition over here. Uh, no, I, I think the answer is yes. I mean, if you if you give me the weights, 
you know, then, 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 I, then I just assume that there is some rho j for which this details balance is satisfied. And then, you know, if I can satisfy this equation, I mean, then, then I'm happy, right? And then, then typically I, I can find out explicitly what, what the rho j's are. But, uh, but, uh, um, uh, but of course, uh, um, yeah, no, I think, I think the answer is actually yes. I mean, so, so okay. if I give you, if you give me weights, uh, then, then I can sort of check whether they satisfy detail balance, yeah. Hmm? Uh, well, what the, 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 the famous theorem of Kolmogorov is, is that the, the, the time reversibility is equivalent to, to the detailed balance condition. No, I, I mean, there is this Kolmogorov uh, loop condition, right? So if I take any loop and C, I, Z, take the product in the reverse direction, they must be equal. Uh, uh, well, the, I, I think, it, I think. Uh, that's probably the, that condition. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah. So, so then, yeah. Okay, so at least my understanding, so the loop condition is so that it can reach, you know, any, any state by any others. I mean, that any state can be reached, I mean, any two states can be reached uh, from each other, right? I mean, that, that's the loop condition. It's the same as I think this one, like the statement you wrote. Basically, if I take any sub uh, set of states and make a sequence of that, and then come back to one, the, it yeah. either um, I get oh, this I way or the oh, other okay. way. No, no, I understand. Thing. Okay, so you want to, you sort of think about cyclic state, I can go either one direction or the other one direction as well. Yes, okay, sorry, yeah, that, that, that's, that, that, that's correct. I mean, here basically, you can think of, you know, what I have written it, it's just sort of for a pair of states, but then of course, I can do a loop, I mean, and then for each yeah. step I apply this condition. Correct, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, I think it, it, my time is up, right? Oh, no, I mean, with which time to die? At least, at least uh, I started at, yeah. okay, so <laughs> I have to wait for the chairman. To <laughs> okay, so, so maybe, maybe um, I, I just want to say one word, uh, you know, how we continue tomorrow. So I guess I, 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 I managed more or less how far I wanted to go. I mean, which means that um, I have explained your detailed balance and, and, and maybe, maybe further things, I mean, uh, uh, why don't you ask me, you know, this afternoon a little bit, you know, uh, about this left and right eigenvectors. I mean, that's something which I will, if somebody's interested, I'm happy to explain. And so what I want to do tomorrow is, uh, is I want to study, uh, you know, the, the, those people who are worried that, that I got too much into formulas. Uh, what, what, what I want to study uh, tomorrow is a very concrete a model which is called the voter model, which is a many body problem, which however sort of, you know, you, you can uh, get, uh, without too much effort you get, can get, I mean, which is non-equilibrium, and without too much effort you can get interesting behavior. So, so this will be, I mean, the, the next topic tomorrow. All right, so thank you very much. Again, assemble at uh, eleven thirty, and I think that tea is there. Or? Ah, so there's tea upstairs, uh, just outside, and then we'll meet at eleven thirty. Okay, so uh, welcome to the second uh, uh, lecture series. Uh, so uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Sita Prashina from uh, IMSC. Uh, we're really grateful to him for. Uh, First of all, uh, I mean, uh, one of the speaker, earlier speakers uh, was not able to come, and uh, we made a very late request to Shitabro, and he kindly accepted. So uh, we are really grateful to him for that. And secondly, I mean, as you can see, uh, he recently fell down and uh, broke his uh, arm. Uh, but in spite of that, he has agreed to uh, give this lecture. So thanks, uh, Shitabro. And he'll uh, give lectures on statistical mechanics of complex mm -hmm. networks. Thanks, Avishek. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, thanking the organizers, Avishek and Shonji, for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak about networks and also a little <coughs> bit of, you know, the kind of stuff we do at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Um, so, uh, the first lecture would be, you know, 
pretty light, uh, not too much maths, um, partly because it will be almost fully on PowerPoint. I'll be I'll not be using the board, or I'll be using the board rather sparingly. Um, but secondly, I thought that uh, maybe most of you uh, do not work on networks. You may be familiar a bit with networks. Can I first have a show of hands? How many of you actually work on networks as part of your research? Okay, so let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so good. So, um, and the rest of you are, have you already had a course on networks? Anyone? No, okay. Oh, okay, two, uh, two. Fine. So, so maybe you know five plus two uh, of you would uh, have some uh, intro to networks, and uh, the rest of you, this might be your first peek into uh, network science. So, um, you know, I don't know about you, but you know, for me, uh, if I'm learning something new, and you know, it's not something I really see how I can use in my work. It stays in my brain just for about three days. And after that, completely washed out. And if you, if you ask me about it like a week later, I won't be able to tell you a single thing. So what I'll try to do is at least try to motivate you to, to see how you can connect network to what you work on, which could be anything, right, on statistical physics. So uh, one uh, you know, kind of fun assignment to you would be after this lecture to see how networks can illuminate some aspect of your problem. Okay? If you can't think about it, maybe we can talk about it during one of the off sessions or in the evenings. But you know, it's, it's a fun exercise just to see how you can connect your work with networks. Because networks is a very, very general language as I'll try to convince you in this particular lecture. So the alternative title of this lecture is What are Networks and Why Networks? Okay, so, um, how do you build a complex system? Let's say you're trying to build a human being. Let's say you're, you know, Victor Frankenstein, and um, you want to like build something which is shown on the right. So, um, you know, uh, we know a bit about the, you know, detailed components list of the human body. So, for example, if you look at uh, uh, Rob Phillips' beautiful book, uh, you know cell biology by the numbers, uh, you'd see this picture, which basically, you know, like uh, gives a count of um, how many cells of what type are there in a typical human body. So for example, uh, the large bulk of uh, human cells essentially consists of erythrocytes. So, you know, let's like say whooping 84%. Uh, compared to that, you know, um, everything else uh, is pretty low. Like muscle cells, as you can see, you know, despite, you know, what Arnold Schwarzenegger might uh, claim, um, you know, that's like 0.001%, right? Um, and I think neurons don't even make it, right? So neurons is basically so little that it's basically put inside other. Right. So um, you have a you know a detailed count of you know like okay these many cells of this type this many cells of this type and so on. Um, you could go even further. So you could actually look at like the you know uh, elementary compositions. So 35 kg oxygen, 6.4 kg hydrogen, 17.5 kg carbon, blah 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 blah. Okay, so. If you are, uh, again, taking a page out of Victor Frankenstein's notebook, instructions for making a human, collect all these component parts, mix and check them, and will you get this? We know it's not possible, right? That's not how things happen. So why not? Well, that's because components is only one part of the story, right? How you connect those components is a very critical part of what makes complex systems work. Okay, so knowing the component parts is important, but certainly not even halfway enough. Okay. So um, we want 
to figure out how these component parts work together. How do they actually interact? Okay. So how do we describe that? Well, what I'll try to convince you is that currently the most efficient language for describing this interaction known to us is given by the language of networks. Okay. So what is a network? Okay. Definition. So um, it essentially is defined by three things. Okay, so you know, if you look at a math book on networks, you'll see that it's uh, a network is usually described. So mathematicians call a network to be graph, but you know, it um, means the same thing. What physicists or you know other scientists would call a network, mathematicians would call a graph, and so you'd see that you know they would typically write. G, and then within parenthesis, they will write N comma L or something like that, okay? And that is a complete description of a network. So what is this N and L? Okay. So N refers to how many component parts are there, okay? Again, depending on whether you're a physicist or a mathematician, you use the name nodes. Uh, so, you know, physicists typically call them nodes. Mathematicians call them vertices. And the L stands for how many interactions or how many links are there between these component parts. So again, physicists would call them links and mathematicians would call them edges. And so if you want to graphically represent a network, uh, these circles represent the components. So um, I'm you know, labeling them from A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And this uh, lines which connect you know, certain pairs of nodes are the links. Okay. Now, um, you could, of course, say this is a complete description of a particular network you're interested in. But it's very hard to work um, you know, using our mathematical language using such pictures. And so if you uh, want to do any uh, you know, analytical calculations, or for that matter, even numerics, you want to go from this description to this description. So this is known as the adjacency matrix. As the name makes it clear, it gives you information about which node is adjacent to which other nodes. And when I say adjacent, I simply mean that this node has an interaction with this other node, unlike in uh, you know, regular lattice in, in for example, in two dimension, uh, you refer to adjacency in terms of, you know, neighborhood, right? So, so you say that if a node uh, has um, like uh, northern, southern, eastern, western neighbors, these are adjacent to it, right? But for that, we need to specify what dimension are we talking about and so on. Here, we are talking about a very abstract space. So we are no, we are no longer talking about this physical d-dimensional space. Okay. So in fact, a node could have um, different number of neighbors. So in the same network, one node could have seven neighbors, another node could have five neighbors, another node could have one neighbor. This is what makes it so general compared to the lattice kind of systems that are traditionally studied in statistical physics. Okay. So, um, here, for example, A, so here, so how do we read the agency matrix? So you'll see that um, it has either zero or a one as an entry. And if a link exists between the row and the column, then um, that particular entry of the matrix is given one, else it's zero. So for, for example, let's see here, okay, so A, is linked to B and A is linked to F. So if you look along the column, you will see that A column has an entry one corresponding to the row for B and corresponding to the row for F, okay? Now, this is what is known as a symmetric network or, or an undirected network in the sense that if a link exists from A to F, a link also exists from F to A. 
So this means that the matrix would also be symmetric. So if you have uh, a one in the eighth column and the bth row, correspondingly, you'll also have a one in the eighth row and the bth column. So you'd, if you just, you know, um, think of this imaginary diagonal, you will just see that, you know, this is basically a symmetric matrix, okay? That need not be true though, okay? So there are directed networks where having interaction from A to B does not necessarily mean that there would be interaction back from B to A. So that matrix would, for example, not be symmetric, okay? but we'll come to that later. Um, so, um, so for example, uh, you would notice that B has a much higher number of links compared to, for example, A. So if you look at B, you would notice that the corresponding row and the column has many ones compared to, for example, the other rows and columns. Okay, so this, this makes it very different from the lattice kind of systems that you know, traditionally statistical mechanics has been used upon. All right? Okay, now you might say, okay, what, what exactly do these uh, nodes or vertices mean? So now, depending upon what you're interested in, this could be anything, okay? So if you're a um, ecologist, for example, or, or if you're working with ecologist, then these nodes could actually correspond to different species, and the interactions could correspond to trophic interactions. So trophic means who eats who, okay? So uh, A could stand for, um, you know, a rabbit, F could stand for a fox, and a link essentially would mean that you know there is a you know prey predator relation between A and F. Of course, strictly speaking, this is a directed network because you know typically foxes eat rabbits, not the other way around. And so uh, you would essentially expect that there would be an arrow going from one node to the other node. Okay. So traditionally, we draw the arrow from the prey to the predator because we say basically there's energy that is being transferred from the prey to the predator. Okay. But let's say you are working with, uh, working in this field of econophysics, okay, and uh, uh, these uh, nodes then can actually stand for uh, the stocks of different companies, and the interactions would essentially indicate how correlated the price movements of these stocks are. So, um, like for example, you know, we, we, uh, there are certain sectors which move, uh, you know, the stocks essentially move together. So, for example, the prime minister comes and announces, uh, you know, new policy on uh, petroleum. Okay, so suddenly all the petrochemical stocks, you know, prices go up or go down, whatever. And so we find that there are very, uh, you know dense set of interactions between the nodes corresponding to petrochemical company stocks, but these need not be connected to, for example, uh, let's say companies which are involved in uh, consumer uh, durables, okay? Let's say. Um, then if you are um, interested in the power grid, for example, then these nodes could correspond to, for example, power generating stations or um, you know, uh, substations which transmit electricity from one area to another. And the links would actually correspond to the high tension line which connects uh, these various substations with the generators and so on. And uh, depending upon which system you're studying, you could be interested in various kinds of questions. So for example, if you're interested in power grid, you might be asking yourself, suppose you, let's say, cut this particular link, what happens to the rest of the system? Do you still manage to you know, uh, get um, decent transmission of power to the entire system, or is there a complete breakdown? Uh, if you are working with ecologists, you could be asking, suppose instead of a link, is this node which goes out of the system? So there could be some extinction of a particular species, and you might ask, okay, suppose this species goes out of the system, 
how does this affect the rest of the ecosystem? Does it result in you know, extinction of uh, further species? And does that result in a cascade so that the entire ecosystem collapses? Or you know, is that particular node more or less irrelevant to the stability of the rest of the ecosystem? Right? So you can ask you know, tons of questions like these using this same common framework. Okay? And that's what gives it you know, huge power. OK, why networks? Okay, so um, of course, one can go back all the way back to this fantastic article by Phil Anderson, uh, which he wrote in Science in 1972. A very perceptive, where he pointed out that um, although uh, there are uh, many sciences whose which deals with you know uh, systems whose component parts obey the laws of some other science, that doesn't automatically mean that the science we're interested in is just the applied version of the science which describes the behavior of the components. So uh, the examples he gave was that, for example, you know, if you are studying solid state physics, uh, we know that uh, the component parts, namely the electrons, are obeying the laws of particle physics. But uh, despite what uh, certain particle physicists might sometimes claim, claim over lunch table, solid state physics is not applied particle physics, right? And if you have done some courses on solid state physics, you can you know, quickly quiz your particle physicist colleague and you can quickly find out that uh, typically the particle physicist will not, not know too much about the solid state physics. Uh, similarly, chemistry uh, deals with molecules. And uh, again, the component parts are mostly studied under many body physics, but that doesn't necessarily mean chemistry is applied many body physics. And you can go like this all the way up to, let's say, you know, psychology. Now, you might say that the brain obeys the laws of physiology, but that doesn't mean that you, know, you can explain schizophrenia uh, or, or a physiologist can explain schizophrenia, right? So uh, you don't essentially become an expert in psychiatry simply by studying you know, how brain processes happen or brain chemistry and so on. And then finally going to social sciences, Yes, uh, you know, crowds or mobs are made out of individuals, but as we all know, uh, a crowd has no mind, right? So individuals in a crowd can be very rational beings, okay, uh, who wouldn't normally dream of harming a fly, and yet when they are part of a crowd of hundreds, they can end up doing unspeakable acts, right? Uh, sad but true. And uh, so, why is this? Well, it's because of a property that we call emergence. When a large number of component parts start interacting with each other, you get new collective properties arising. And this process by which, you know, this collective properties, which can't be explained simply by knowing the properties of the constituent parts, that is what we call emergence. So um, in one way, you can say that the reason why networks uh, is such a powerful language is that it helps us to you know, describe how a network of interacting components results in the emergence of behavior which is qualitatively different from its individual components. And, uh, uh, you can have any example actually you want, but uh, you know one particular example I really like is that, you know, if you look at our brain, that's kind of made out of um, you know roughly 10 to the power 12 neurons. Okay. Now, of course, uh, you know each neuron is quite a complicated object, and yet, uh, no matter what the complexity of the individual neuron, it pales into insignificance compared to the complexity when this 10 to by 12 neurons start talking to each other and starts giving this lecture, for example. Okay. So um, the network science is about understanding how these interactions result in complexity at the systems level. Okay. But at this point, you'd say, hold on a sec. Isn't that what statistical physics is all about? 
<laughs> you have just replaced statistical physics with networks and you're now selling you know, networks as kind of what we thought statistical physics was all about. Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a very good question actually. So, so where does uh, you know, networks you know, start uh, and where does uh, you know, like traditional statistical physics end, you might say? Well, um, first of all, you wouldn't be too far wrong in thinking that statistical mechanics is also precisely uh, invented for answering that question of how do collective properties emerge out of components which don't exhibit any such properties. And uh, historically, uh, this had come about because uh, physics had you know, developed uh, these two branches quite independently. So on the one hand, you had classical mechanics, which was focused on a single particle, right? A tip or a single or a few particles. And uh, here the relevant variables were position and momentum. And starting from the phenomenology, for example, Kepler's laws, uh, the foundations of the science were laid by Newton. Okay? Uh, almost independently, uh, you had another science developing, uh, which was that of thermodynamics. And unlike classical mechanics, this is actually looking at a huge number of particles, right? So, you know, typically Avogadro number of particles, right? And here the relevant variables are pressure, volume, temperature. And again, you know, it followed a similar path in the sense that first you had the phenomenology of Boyle's law, Charles' law, Gay Lucas' law, and then eventually in a 19th century, the foundations of the science were laid by Carnot, Clausius, and others. Right? Now, the interesting part is, until the middle of the 19th century, there was very little conversation between these two branches. You can see that you know, they didn't have a common language to speak of. These were speaking in terms of position and momentum. These were speaking in terms of pressure, volume, and temperature. So how do you talk about pressure, volume, temperature of a single particle? It doesn't make sense. How do you talk about position and momentum of Avogadro number of particles? Difficult, right? Essentially impossible. So, uh, and what, but you know, you might say, okay, let them be independent. What's the big deal, okay? The problem is that there are emergent properties when you go from here to here. And one of the most significant one is the arrow of time. Okay. So as far as we know, the laws of Newton are completely time reversible. Okay. But when you come to thermodynamics, suddenly you find that processes do not go forward and backward with equal probability. Example. Well, uh, you can just take this piece of chalk and let's say with enormous force throw it to the ground, it will break into two, right? Or multiple pieces. Uh, what's the probability that those broken pieces of chalk would spontaneously come together, jump off the ground, and come to my hand? Yeah, effectively zero, right? But nothing in the laws of Newton prevents this. Okay. So it, it's just extremely improbable that such is going to happen. Okay. But this is a conundrum, right? So what is it that makes certain direction probable and certain, the opposite direction improbable? So, so that's essentially what we call the arrow of time. That Typically, you know, processes going a macroscopic processes tend to occur in a particular direction, not in the reverse direction. Okay. So um, we didn't have a way of, you know, figuring out this uh, reason for the. So, so the arrow of time is basically such an emergent collective property. Okay. And of course, we had to wait for uh, Ludwig Boltzmann and his discovery and his invention of statistical mechanics to start answering this question. Okay. So what does networks give which uh, traditional statistical mechanics hasn't already given? Okay. 
So this brings us to the question of why do you have a course of lectures on networks in a school on statistical physics at all? <laughs> so what I would try to convince you is that it is in fact giving you the power to generalize statistical mechanics to systems beyond those for which it was traditionally used. So, you know, statistical physics uh, is trying to describe the emergent collective properties of a large number of interacting elements. That's very true. Now, what is crucial is that these collective properties do depend on how these interactions are arranged. Case in point, we all know if you take a one-dimensional chain of easing spins, we know that it doesn't show ordering at any, temp at any finite temperature. But if you go to two dimension, we know that a 2D lattice of easing spins can show ordering even at a finite temperature. So for all temperatures below a critical temperature, you'd see ordering. So we know that how you arrange these interactions, whether you arrange them along a row in one dimension or whether you arrange them along a two-dimensional lattice makes a crucial difference as to whether you will see ordering in the presence of noise or not. So if just simple change in the dimensionality of the lattice can change the collective property, that starts making you think, OK, what if I go beyond a regular lattice? Can I have? a generalized description of interactions that need not necessarily assume that you only interact with, let's say, your north, south, east, west, you know, adjacent individuals, adjacent neighbors. Okay. Can I have a very general way of having these interactions? So uh, the net, so, uh, you know, Going from a regular lattice, which could be, you know, in some D dimension, we want a generalized description of the structural arrangement, or as we sometimes say in the network lingo, could we have arbitrary connection topologies between the components of the network? And that is where networks comes in. It allows us to generalize the structural arrangement of the interactions on which we can apply networks. Yeah. Um, okay, so there have been attempts at doing this. Um, uh, but um, I, I don't think there is a particularly well accepted way of defining a dimension. Okay, so you know, you, usually you define dimension by saying, like, how many neighbors do you have, right? Um, what do you do with a system where the number of neighbors, the distribution of the number of neighbors itself is, uh, you know, heavily skewed distribution. So like, you know, if you look at the average, the average could be, you know, I don't know, maybe three, but there could be uh, as high a degree as thousand. Okay. So then how do you even assign uh, a dimension? Which is not to say there haven't been attempts at trying to, you know, capture using an effective dimensionality. Okay. Right, so, uh, so the point I'm trying to make here is that, and this is where you know, I said that you, know, uh, you could try thinking where networks could come into your research, is that almost every phenomenon that we study in statistical physics, you know, using typically lattices, you can port to a generalized network structure. Okay? And the reason for doing this porting is that sometimes the network structure is a better description of the arrangement of the interactions than a lattice. Okay. So for example, if you are doing percolation, uh, you know, whether bond or site, okay, traditionally you do it on a lattice. Right? But uh, let's say you are looking at, uh, you know, for example, um, how do sedimentary rocks or how uh, oil kind of uh, gets into the pores of a sedimentary rock. Okay. Uh, 
this doesn't necessarily follow a regular lattice. Okay, so for a while, you know, people were using fractals to describe this, but um, a good general description would be to think of this as a network. So the system of branchings that are there in the sedimentary rock along which oil is, for example, percolating, could be described by a network. And then you can ask, okay, what are the properties that such a network system would exhibit if I'm, let's say, studying bond percolation or side percolation in such a system? Okay. And this, of course, has practical uh, spin-offs because, for example, uh, petrochemical companies which uses um, you know, this technology where they uh, pump water at extremely high pressure into sedimentary rocks in order to get the oil out would like to know that if you have a particular structure of networks, then what is the pressure at which, you know, um, or what is the most efficient way of pumping in water such that you can get the oil out of those sedimentary rocks? Random walks, okay? Again, this is traditionally, you know, done in um, three-dimensional lattices. And sometimes these uh, have been, for example, invest used to investigate polymers like you know, proteins and so on. Again, you can do the, all of this on a network. Okay. So uh, instead of saying that you, know, you are confined to some you know, nearest neighborhood where each site is, let's say, having 2D nearest neighbors, you could say that every site has arbitrary number of neighbors you know, according to some you know, number of neighbors distribution that you can impose or that the particular system that you are interested uh, has. Okay. Diffusion, again, traditionally we study diffusion you know, in a regular lattice, but you know, if you look at some realistic system, so for example, this is grain boundary diffusion, you know that you know, typically the grains do not have the same number of neighbors and you would, like to study uh, diffusion in a much more generalized setting. And so you can do this by studying diffusion on a general network. Spin ordering. Okay. So uh, again, traditionally we do this on a d-dimensional lattice, but there's no particular reason why you have to do it on a lattice. Okay. You can do it in a system, which is a network, such that every spin has you know, a particular given number of other neighboring spins that it can interact with. Now, you might say, hold on a second. I mean, uh, spins, you know, especially if you're considering you know, material systems, do occur in a lattice, right? So isn't uh, a lattice system appropriate for this? Yes, in the specific context of materials, maybe you're right, but the Thing is that we use spin models way beyond the context of just material science, right? So, so we use spins, for example, to also to understand coordination. Like how, how uh, for example, do people make up their mind to vote yes or no in a referendum? So suppose you're modeling using you know, an easing model. Uh, how do people decide yes or no? Okay. So, uh, in a traditional statmec context, you would say, okay, let me imagine that the people are basically on a lattice, a two-dimensional lattice, say, and um, uh, they are, um, let's say, looking at their neighbors. Um, and if this is a two-dimensional lattice, they are just looking at their four neighbors, and depending upon what the majority of their neighbors are going to vote, they might switch their original intention, okay? But that's kind of unreal, right? I mean, we don't really, you know, each of us have, let's say, exactly the same number of neighbors. Uh, some gregarious individuals would have, you know, hundreds of uh, friends. Uh, some loners would tend to have one or zero. And so if you really want to understand how the collective decision takes place, you might want to study these kinds of ordering or coordination behavior on a 
generalized network rather than on a lattice. Well, uh, if you take a random lattice, so I assume that by random lattice you mean you take a lattice and then you start deleting yeah. links, yeah. right? Is, is that what you mean? Change the number of neighbors is sort of like a random number. Or, you know, there's a lot of way of just constructing random lattices. And so that's just, uh, yeah, so, so way I would understand random lattice is you take a d-dimensional lattice and then you start wiping out links and borders, right? Yes. So the thing is that that still, you know, gives you, you know, some kind of upper bound depending upon a d-dimension yeah. on what is your maximal degree, okay? Here you take out that constraint, okay. Okay. all right? Um, no, no bound on the maximal degree, uh, so I mean, Yeah, so you, so you can impose arbitrary degree distributions, okay? Which is not something that you can do on a uh, random lattice, for example. Any other questions? Yeah. So let's say uh, Karen came and said, what can you split out into a decision tree? What would be the node and what would be the link? Um, in this particular case? Yes. Yeah. So for example, if you are thinking of uh, a spin as an individual, OK, and the up state or the down state as a yes or no opinion, OK? So the state is the individual's opinion, okay? So that's, that's the, so the node is the individual. And the interactions here correspond to, for example, if you're looking at exchange interactions among easing spins, right? So it's basically how the opinions of the neighbors are affecting the neighbor in question, okay? So let's say I'm surrounded by people who want to vote yes in a particular referendum. So my local field is going to then start pressurizing me to start saying yes, right? Uh, I could, of course, also impose an external field, okay, or even a local field. So local field would correspond to something like my inherent, uh, you know, bias. So I could, you know, have a very strong feeling for, let's say, voting no. But Given that all my neighbors, all my friends are voting yes, I might feel a strong inclination then to change my original bias, right? And then on addition, you can actually have also have temperature, which is like the uncertainty. So, you know, like, I'm, I can't make up my mind, okay? So, so to what degree, you know, I'm like basically uncertain about it. So this is the analogy in which, you know, I'm, I'm using over here. A diffusion, or for that matter, random walks, would correspond to, so for example, suppose you take a communication network, okay? Um, and you are basically sending packets of data along this communication network. At each branch point, okay, it has to choose a particular path to take, all right? So if this is being done completely at random, normally it's not. I mean, you know, you usually use some protocol to decide which path. If you, if you decide to take, so it will basically say that, you know, so if a particular branch point has k, other, k paths coming out of it, okay, so this data packet enters it from one path, and then it has k minus one other paths that it can choose from, assuming that it doesn't want to go back the way it came, okay? So, if it chooses this with equal probability, then with one by k minus one probability, it chooses one of them and then takes that particular path and then goes to the next branching point and then again another decision emerges, okay? So here, the nodes correspond to each of those junction points and the links corresponds to the particular link from one junction point to another, okay? Any other questions? Uh, great question. Just just wait till the end. 
Great question. Yeah, so you have, you have pointed to, you know, uh, in some sense, the limitation of the particular language I'm speaking and how you can, how one can actually try to go beyond. And, and that's actually a very, very, you know, exciting new area. I mean, okay, I wouldn't say exactly new because computer scientists have been working on it for quite a while, but physicists have, you know, come into the party late, but uh, that's actually a very active area. Um, okay, so can you give me a, a little more information? Can you make it a bit more concrete? Ah, okay, okay, fantastic. That's pretty easy. So you can say that these links are weighted, okay. weighted. So each of these links, see, um, uh, you remember that matrix I showed you, which has zeros and ones, okay? Now, I said that it's a very special case of an undirected network which has a symmetric matrix, right? What I forgot to mention, and thank you for you know, asking this question, is that it's also a special case in another way that it assumes that these links either exist or don't exist. It has no separate quality to it, okay? You can, however, assign a weight or strength to each of this interaction. And then you get what is known as a weight matrix, okay? So the zeros remain zeros. If you don't have a connection, of course you have zeros. But instead of a one, you could have some W subscript IJ, okay? And um, you could also, for example, have negative and positive interactions. So some interactions could be positive, some interactions could be negative. And that's actually very important, for example, the example of uh, stock market I gave. So some correlations could be positive, some correlations could be negative. Okay, so for example, Pepsi and Coke has negative correlation in their prices. So whenever the Pepsi price goes up, typically Coke prices fall. Okay. It's very hard to detect though, because there are other effects which tend to mask this. But if you manage to take out all these uh, you know, like other uh, signals, you actually see that there is a anti-correlation between the price fluctuations of these two companies, okay? But um, like, for example, um, you know, uh, the prices of two petrochemical companies often tend to be very strongly positively correlated. So we know that you could have plus and minus kind of links also. So there could be qualitative as well as quantitative variations of these interactions. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. The interactions would be governed by the weights of these edges. True. Yes. The yeah. One or minus one, yeah, okay. How do you sort of incorporate this as a new dimension? Which factor? Like, oh, that's not, that's, uh, that's pretty easy. So, um, see, that has got nothing to do with networks per se. Networks is just telling you how the interactions are arranged, okay? So, see, in a, Traditional lattice, like for example in 2D, you take this spin and you basically look at your neighbors, okay? Okay, so let's say you have nearest and next nearest neighbors, okay? So you are basically just looking at your neighborhood, okay? And then uh, calculating the free energy difference that, you know, if you remain up versus if you remain down, what is the free energy difference? And then on the basis of that, you know, you calculate the probability that you will flip, you know, given the temperature, right? In a network system, you just change this to like something like this.
something like this. And now you can do exactly the same calculation, right? Because you're asking, okay, what would be my change in free energy if I flip this particular spin? Okay, so you look at your neighbors and you calculate the probability. Nothing else changes except the details about your neighborhood. Okay, and the fact that now each spin has a different number of neighboring spins. Right? And also, see previously, if you do it in a lattice, for example, there is a lot of what we call as clustering, in the sense that many of your neighbors are also mutual neighbors, right? So uh, let's say you look at n n uh, nearest and next nearest neighbors. So this neighbor of yours and this neighbor of yours are also mutual neighbors, okay? So there's a high degree of clickishness or clustering in such lattices. Here, on the other hand, I've deliberately created a network where your neighbors are not mutual neighbors, okay? All right, so there's also the generalization of that, that you can actually tune how much cl clickishness or clustering you want in your lattice. Right? Or, sorry, not a lattice, on your, on your, in your system. Yeah? One more question, so you're saying, uh, so the current, currently the description is that the, that the coupling does not depend on the states so if I want it up, up to have you know, some energy, up, down, down, up, down, down, each of four, four different energies, which are not necessarily just the product of their Z components. Then okay, uh, so, so, so you are saying that... Or maybe just a Heisenberg model with different XX, YY, Z components. So, so I am just doing this very simple system where the energy is proportional to yes. just this. Yeah, so what way do you want to generalize this? So let's say that it also, uh, so if I have, you know, vector spin, and so the simplest model I can think of right now is, you know, gijx times sijx sjx plus gijy times siy sjy. You see, so the different components talk with different strengths. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that case, will the bond represent a vector with these three strengths, gij? No, you can have three components in each bond, right? Like, like for example, in the lattice yeah. example, you just had, you know, there was only one bond. Yeah. You just had a three component bond, like a vector bond, right? Yeah, so the bond will represent the vector. Then. So you can do exactly the same thing here. Okay, nothing changes. N nodes can be isolated, absolutely right. So often what we do is uh, if you have a network which is fragmented, okay? So you could not only have an isolated node, you could also have an isolated graphlet. That is, you can have a few nodes which are connected with each other but are not connected to the bulk of the network, okay? In such cases, we typically look at the largest connected component depending on the system, depending on the problem we are studying, okay? In fact, that is going to be something that I'm going to talking, uh, be talking about tomorrow, where we ask, you know, that suppose with some probability P, we are putting in links in a system of N nodes. We're constructing a net network, okay? So obviously, you know, if P is very small, that means the network will not be connected in the sense that most of the, them will be fragments. So there is a critical value of P beyond which the network becomes connected in the sense that the giant component essentially spans the system or the giant component becomes an extensive variable. Uh, that is, it starts increasing with N, okay? And then uh, if you make P sufficiently high, then you basically guarantee that all nodes would be connected to at least one other node of the giant component. Okay? So then essentially you don't have any isolated part. Okay? But um, typically we would be looking at a connected network because even if we have a fragmented system like that, we tend to focus on the largest connected component. Yeah. 
So that's what I said, that what you could have is a local field. See, you have this uh, random field leasing model, right? So where corresponding to each spin, you have a HI, right? So that's what I called a bias. So let's say you have some inherent bias to vote no, okay? That could be overridden if most of your neighborhood is actually doing the opposite thing, right? Okay, so, in, so, so, but it's a very important question. So one of the things we uh, will see is that typically we don't assume self loops, okay? So if you went back to the adjacency matrix that I talked about, you would see that the diagonal is all zeros, okay? Um, the self loop, uh, absence of self loop <coughs> is something that is true for most networks. We typically don't consider it, uh, except under very, very special circumstances, okay? So there are, you know, it, it's actually fairly rarity to find systems which actually have self loops, okay? All right? So, uh, Typically, in an agency matrix, you would find that the diagonal elements are all zeros, okay? Which doesn't mean that you can't include self-interactions. You could in include self-interaction in dynamical processes by, for example, other means, okay? All right, hopefully that's it, all right. Okay, and last but not the least, uh, you could have things like, for example, synchronization of oscillators. So this is on a regular lattice on a one-dimension system. So you have these metronomes, which um, you know, essentially are set at some initial random phases, and then they are being coupled through the vibrations on this common platform on which they're all located, okay? So to make sure that uh, the vibration is not damped, this is placed on two soft drink cans, and so this interaction now would actually make all of these metronomes eventually go to in phase. Okay? So this is on a one-dimensional array, but you can study the same thing, for example, on a general network. And you might ask, okay, why look at synchronization oscillators in a network? That's because synchronization of oscillators is linked to many important processes, including the things which are going on in our brain. So parts of our brain communicate with other parts of our brain by synchronizing the firing patterns. And since uh, each brain region has connections to differing number of other brain <coughs> regions, the way to investigate this is to try to look at how oscillators interact with each other if you place them on a network and under what conditions do they synchronize. All right, so um, to summarize, why networks instead of lattice? Because it provides a language to more accurately describe the structural arrangement of interaction in loads of real systems which occur across physical, biological, and social contexts. And just to give an example of this in the living world, you can see how networks appear across scales, starting from you know, the molecular scale. So you, know, you can think of the protein as a network, a single protein, because uh, each of its constituents, namely the amino acid, uh, interacts through Van der Waals forces with other amino acids which are near it. So the carbon alpha atom of one particular amino acid would have Van der Waals interactions and so on with uh, another amino acid. And you can describe the tertiary structure of the protein as essentially a network where the nodes are the amino acids, or for that matter, the carbon alpha atom of that amino acid. And the links correspond to the presence or absence of a Van der Waals interaction between a pair of adjacent amino acids. If you go up the scale, you can look at, uh, so the cell is actually full of networks. I'll give an example of this at the end of my current lecture. Uh, just one of these uh, networks is the one which controls intracellular signaling. So intracellular signaling is like the cell's own nervous system. Okay. 
Now, the nervous system is, of course, you know, uh, itself a multicellular system because each neuron is a cell. Okay? But if you look at a single cell, okay, and in fact, I think Shakuntala actually would be giving wonderful examples of this because the, the bacterial chemotaxis is a fantastic example of how the cell, in fact, does a lot of stuff which we require the nervous system to do. Okay, so, so in a sense, you can think of the cell's signaling machinery as its brain. Okay? So um, if you look at intracellular signaling, you see that it is coordinated by a large number of molecules, typically you know, kinases, um, then second messengers like calcium, and so on, which are the components. And the interactions are typically enzyme substrate reactions. Okay. So kinases are typically enzymes which essentially add a phosphate group to another enzyme, thereby activating it. So there are all these cascades of one kinase activating another kinase, which activates another kinase, and so on. And eventually, something happens, like you know, a particular gene is started to. Uh, you know, switch on so that it can start producing proteins. If you go up the scale even further, you have multicellular systems of, for example, the neuronal communication, but another very good example is our immune system, okay, which is a distributed network, distributed throughout our body. So here, the components or the nodes are cells, and the interactions could be the chemical synapses, or the electrical gap junctions, which allow communication to occur from one cell to another. Go up even one scale further, and you, we come to population. So here the nodes are individual organisms, like us. And the interactions correspond to, you know, let's say, physical contact. Okay? So for example, if you're interested in epidemics, something which is very topical these days, this is the network that you'd be interested in. You know, how does a particular contagion go from one end of a population to another end of the population by propagating through such a network? And then uh, at even larger scale, you have food webs where the nodes are species. And the interactions, as I said, correspond to trade predatory relations, or for that matter, even competitive relations. So you know, uh, rabbits and uh, Sheep may not be eating each other, but they are competing for the same resource. They are led eating grass, right? So if uh, there are lots of rabbits, they would be eating up uh, most, most of the grass and leave very little for the sheep. And so there would be competition between them. So that also is a kind of interactions. <coughs> On a completely different uh, you know, front, we have social networks. And with the rise of social media, of course, this has become you know, very, very, um, you know, what do you call, um, emerging area of research, especially for computer scientists. So here, individuals could, uh, the number of nodes could range anywhere between three. So you know, the moment you have three people, you have a non-trivial kind of system. Two people. Uh, we don't really consider that to be very interesting network-wise. But the moment we have three people, lots of interesting questions arise. Okay. I'll, I'll uh, allude to it in a later lecture. Okay. And uh, all the way up to, let's say, almost the population of the planet. Okay. So they could all be part of some social uh, media network. Okay. And the links are social interactions. Well, this number 150 per node is actually, uh, I must say, um, more uh, to do with you know, actual you know, offline social networks rather than online social networks. Because online social network, I know people have millions of followers and so on. But you know, uh, to be fair, you know, uh, those millions of followers typically don't have regular interactions with the individual they're linked to. Right? I mean, they're just, they're just you know, following this person or whatever. Uh, if you think of social interaction as meaningful exchanges, where you know you and that other person have actually conversations, regular conversations, you know we don't typically tend to have many such interactions. And um, so these interactions essentially, you know, mean that A knows B. You know, this node 
knows this node, and how do you actually measure this? So it could be, for example, uh, you know, phone calls, emails, likes on social media, physical proximity. Okay, how do you measure physical proximity? Um, well, there have been uh, you know trial runs where uh, students in a I think a U.S. school were given this device uh, which they wore. And so this uh, device, essentially, when, when another person comes within, let's say, a particular distance of each other, it records which person came in close to them. Okay? So at the end of the day, you just hand it over, or you, know, you just give this information to someone, and then basically you create a network. Okay? So uh, as you can imagine, this cannot be actually done on a steady basis, you know, because uh, it, of course, has uh, invasion of privacy issues and so on. In fact, I was told by uh, one of my French collaborators that uh, some uh, scientific group actually tried to do this uh, experiment where uh, they went to a medical conference and all the people attending these conferences, typically doctors and so on, were given this ID badges. And the ID badges had a small chip. And that chip essentially recorded who they were very you know, proximal to. Unknown to them. I, originally, the chip was was supposed to be for. I mean, they knew the chip was there, but they thought the chip was for you know like buying coffee and stuff like that. Okay, but the chip was also recording this. And so then, uh, at the end of the conference, the scientific group you know uh, came uh, came up and said that you know um, we didn't disclose this to you because we just wanted to see you know uh, how you actually interact with each other. Uh, when uh, you know, because otherwise, if we if we tell you, of course, you would be tailoring your you won't be seeing certain people and so on. So so this is the network we saw, and as you might imagine, there was a furious explosion because it turned out lots of people disappeared with lots of other people they shouldn't have been seen with. Uh, doctors are notorious for this, and uh, <laughs> that was the end of that experiment. Okay. So. Um, so there are a lot of privacy issues, you know, especially when it comes to humans. Uh, you can also look at, you know, like trades, like you know, do do these people kind of trade with each other very often and so on. And as one of you asked, uh, we do see that not all relations are equally strong. You know, we tend to talk more often to some people than to other people, right? So so these are these you know, networks are clearly weighted. Um, which brings us to this very interesting topic of where does this 150 number come from? So this sometimes goes by the name of Robin Dunbar. It's known as Dunbar's number. And Dunbar, in a somewhat controversial uh, work, suggested that um, all primates have a limited cognitive capability of forming you know, so many friendships at any, or forming so many social relations at any one time. Okay. So um, you know, why? Because uh, in order to maintain uh, social relations with x number of people, you not only need to know all those x people, but also how they interact with each other. Right? It will be very embarrassing for you to be friends with both A and B if you know that A and B are, you know, hate each other's guts, right? You don't want to be seen in, with A, you know, with, you know, a B coming towards you, right? So you need to know how they interact with each other. So that's a, that's a huge lot of information to process, right? In fact, people have argued that the reason for our big brains is not so that we could do statistical physics, but in order to negotiate these very tricky social landmines, okay? in order to live in a group, we need to be very careful we don't rub the wrong people the wrong way. Okay? And that's the reason why we have developed this enormous processing capability. Okay? And to argue for this, they have shown that if you look at the Ratio of the neocortex to the brain. Neocortex is where most of our you know, uh, complicated processing takes place. It has a very interesting correlation with the mean group size of primates. Okay? So 
Primates which live in smaller groups tend to have smaller neocortices relative to their brains. Primates which live in very large groups, and humans are of course, you know, at the top end of the scale, have enormously large brains, enormously large neocortices related to the brain. Okay. And so, uh, we don't know which causes which. Is it that our large brains allow us to live in larger groups, or is it that in order to live in larger groups, we develop larger brains? That's like you know, putting the chicken before the egg. But Dunbar has suggested that by extrapolating this curve, you can estimate that 150 is about the maximal number of meaningful relationships that humans can have. Okay? And so this is basically, you know, like, of course, not all of these relations are equally powerful. Uh, so you know, like the closest relationships could be fairly few, then good friends, then friends, and finally, you know, like uh, nodding acquaintances. Right? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you'll have to look at this paper in Science uh, by Dunbar and Schultz. So they were basically looking at uh, a large number of studies uh, done on primate groups. So in fact, uh, Aninda Sinha, who works in the National Institute of Advanced Studies right here in this city, so I collaborated with him. So he actually works on several such uh, primate groups. So there's a, uh, there's a national forest called Bandipur, not very far from here. So there are a few uh, macaque troops which actually have stood together for years. You know, like uh, they last for you know, several decades. So basically, these, uh, their PhD students basically follow around these groups and you know, investigate how they are kind of, uh, so, so you know, like what's the proxy for uh, social relations? It's not likes, it's not conversations, it's grooming. So uh, uh, macaques groom each other not just for hygiene, but also as a way of you know, forming bonds. So you, know, uh, you, uh, you have been beaten to pulp by the alpha male, uh, and you're moping. Well, some sympathetic friend comes and starts grooming you to show, you know, I care, right? So uh, that, that's how they study it. Sorry, uh, what about neocortices? Sorry? Did they measure that? I mean, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so neocortex ratio is something you can you know, take, uh, yeah. Yeah, of course, it's, it's done on a dead animal. You know, you, you, can't, you can't do it with um, live animals. Yeah. So I guess there's not a huge difference between 60 and 150, right? Uh, I mean, in terms of the number, like that for the monkeys, it's, is it 60, around 50, or something like that? Uh, so these are, uh, so when, when they I mean say- like that corresponding number that one Yes, yes. So, 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 you know, humans belong to the group of apes mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, sorry, the, I forget, is that, uh, is that a genus or whatever? So uh, monkeys are a separate genus, okay? So uh, what they are showing is that essentially it forms a rough, uh, you know, uh, linear relation on a log log scale. No, I, I'm wondering what is the corresponding number, let's say 150 for monkeys or... Apes? No, so what you're doing is you take this apes, for example, mm -hmm. okay, uh, and basically you say that, look, if this actually corresponds to a, you know, a power relation, mm -hmm. then given that human neocortex ratio is this, what would be the mean group size? So that's how you roughly... Yeah, yeah no, yeah. that I understand. Yeah. So for... Apes or monkeys, it will be about 50, 60. That, um, uh, no, so, so, so again, that depends upon which monkey you're talking about. So, so one is on the top. Yeah, so, so these are all different species, yeah. for Let's example. Let's say I take one of yeah. the highest. Uh, yeah, so this, so this is by observation. So they know that this particular the monkeys live in an average group size of about 60. So I guess only this number is not enough to have a large gissing, right? You also probably need something like propaganda or something which humans are very good at doing that, right? To have it, I mean, like, in terms of just having a large, uh, uh, I mean, given that humans are so successful having large kind of meaningful thing, yeah. it's not this number 150 versus 60, probably uh, more than that we also try to find some common thing where all try to agree on that, right? Probably that. No, so, so it depends upon what you exactly meaning, mean by meaningful relationships here. Yeah. So meaningful relationships does not mean that, you know, you agreed on something. So for example, you know, 
I often uh, sign on this um, usual email sent around, you know, protesting against various abuses of power, right? But that doesn't mean that I'm friends or I have even meaningful relationships with all the signatories. So no, I just... Yeah. So what I meant is that, <coughs> I mean, humans are successful in the sense that they also, I guess, able to ally like in the name of religion or in the name of some political ideologies, which goes much beyond this 150 number, right? Maybe like a million people might have a similar ideology. No, Which but more okay. Important than so, 50, 150 versus 60. okay. So, so good point. The point is that this is not about having the same ideology. It's about having regular conversation. So, when you have meaningful relationship, that means you know, you know, like with most of my colleagues at math science, you know, I may not even have a nodding acquaintance. Okay, I'm talking about the people whom I actually gravitated to in the coffee room during coffee break. Okay, if you count that. That number is actually fairly low, okay? which doesn't necessarily mean that I won't agree with them on you know, certain issues. You know, cer certainly, we are all physicists. We all agree that uh, you know, uh, liberal ideology is the way to go and so on. And I will you know, sign any uh, letter that comes around. But I won't necessarily go and talk to them in coffee. Yeah. Okay? So, so me by meaningful relationship, that's what I mean. They, look, first of all, there are you know a lot of simplification. As I said, this is highly controversial. But uh, as regards bandwidth, uh, it is, well, well. First of all, no, no, no. Ants, you're going to a completely different thing. Okay, so that's why you know let's not go beyond monkeys and apes. Let's only talk about that. See here, when you talk about these complex things, it turns out that. Uh, oh, we actually, you know, talking about like how complex ideas can you do? Like for example, deception. So we know that primates actually engage in deception, very similar to humans. Like so, for example, you know, the alpha male is around, and uh, you can have spotted that nice juicy banana over there, and you know that you know the alpha male is looking at you, and the moment you try going there, the alpha male will see this banana and uh, you know take it away from you. So what you do is you give an alarm call which indicates that you know, some predator is coming. So the alpha male is distracted. At that moment, you go and grab the banana and take it. So, so we know that primates and monkeys actually have fairly complex mental models of their social structure. And as regards you know, how complex emo emotions and ideas can be exchanged forward, I was just mentioning allogrooming, right? So allogrooming can actually take a whole variety of forms. So instead of conversation, they use allogrooming for a whole lot of different things, consolation, support, you know, I'm there for you, all kinds of things. Okay? So even without vocal communication, you can actually express a lot of emotional you know, content through just these kinds of uh, means. Yeah. Well, then you're better than me. Uh, I, I have lots of people whom I barely send an email once a year. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just kidding. Okay, in the sense that, you know, just sending regular emails requires a lot of investment of time and effort. Okay, so even with emails, yes, technology has made it easier, but you'll be amazed how many letters people in the 18th and 19th century used to write to each other. So if you look at, like, for example, Darwin's correspondence, you know, I, I don't even write that many emails, the number of letters he used to write. Okay? It's amazing you know, just the amount of time and effort these people used to spend in communicating with each other. So it's a bit of a, you know, like a simplification to say that somehow technology has made us more communicative. Ah, OK. So can, we, can you hold the question until uh, lunchtime? Because, uh, that's that's going to be, I think, a major. Uh, yeah. So if I look at the y axis. Yeah. So that's the mean group size, the median group size. 
Yeah. But when we extrapolate that to human beings, we are saying we need to reduce it. Yeah. Just because the mean size of the food we are eating that does not mean we want to eat it. We have to reduce the weight of the food. Very good. So here, typically, no, your, your question is spot on. So uh, by mean group size, they mean that what is the group? So typically within a group, everybody is interacting with everybody, okay, in a, in a primate group, okay. Humans, on the other hand, especially, you know, after the urban revolution, live in societies where we live in very close proximity with a large number of individuals, but we don't necessarily interact with them, okay. So what Dunbar is trying to do here is say that if, Humans did live in bands, and in fact, he has tried to confirm this by looking at, uh, you know, Stone Age societies like Bushmen of the Kalahari and so on, and try to see what is the group size, typical group size of those groups. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, is it related to this? Okay. Um, okay, so, so, you know, Dunbar has been at it for a fairly long time. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is as yet no quanti good quantitative, you know, measure of a meaningful relationship. Because, you know, uh, when it comes to social network formation, we always get down to this problem of how do you actually measure a social network link? Like, is the length of a telephone conversation a good indicator? or is the number of telephone conversations a good indicator? All kinds of things crop up, right? So um, let me not, you know, say, you know, because first of all, you know, I'm, I'm not here to defend Dunbar. I, I just wanted to point out that this is very interesting, controversial thing, but your uh, point is very well taken that in absence of a good and accepted quantitative indicator of meaningful relationship, this will, of course, remain a conjecture more than a, you know, like a statement. All right, can we just carry on forward? Because I just realized that I'm like way out of time. And I'm, uh, I'll, I'll just, you know, come, come back to you during lunch. Okay, so um, uh, if you look at social networks in the fictional world, they actually tend to be way simpler than the, you know, our real social networks. So for example, uh, there are these beautiful uh, social networks done for uh, the six novels of Jane Austen. Uh, and you can see that, you know, typically these are uh, very few nodes, very densely connected, pretty different from, you know, real social networks. Same thing for Shakespeare. Um, they, uh, and, and these are like three of Shakespeare's tragedy, tragedies. So you can see that, you know, the, the, all the nodes are almost connected to each other. I mean, well, okay, not true. I mean, uh, you have 39% network density. So that means what fraction of pairs of nodes are actually connected to each other? So 39% of them are connected to each other. So this is way more than real social networks. In real social networks, we don't tend to have you know, such high network densities. Uh, in what are the sizes? Sorry? What are the sizes of the circles denoting? The, how big the circles? Oh, OK. So for how long they are in the, so how important uh, they are in the play. So the duration they are in stage, essentially by looking at the dialogue conversation. Is it more, uh, the oh, the, whether they were in the stage together. Ah. Okay. So interestingly, uh, it turns out that, uh, OK. So. Uh, why is it that fictional social networks are always simpler than those in real life? Well, one conjecture is that uh, if our larger brains are indeed for negotiating our tricky social landscape, then essentially we are spending our whole lifetime learning our social networks. Right? On the other hand, if you go to see a movie or if you're reading a book, you're spending you know, maybe an hour and a half or maybe at best a week in learning that social landscape. So there's no way you're going to actually figure out the complicated social network to make sense of what's going on in the story. So authors, in order to make their story not densely impenetrable, typically tend to make the social network much simpler. Okay? And interestingly, it turns out the social networks of Shakespeare's play 
do show a tendency to become larger and sparser as he went from his early plays to his late plays. So, you know, in a sense, it's trying to become more and more like real social networks. Uh, so this, this line comes from, you know, uh, I, I, you know I, I'm using this, recycling this slide from a course I once gave uh, to uh, some undergrads, and I was trying to motivate them to do a similar exercise with Indian uh, works, in particular the Mahabharata. Okay. Unfortunately, none of the undergraduates had courage enough to pick this up, but you know, it's an idea if you're interested. Uh, right, and uh, they don't always need to be, uh, of course, simple. One exception is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So some intrepid person put this up on Reddit. So this is just part of the full graph. So I just wonder like how much man hours were spent on you know, creating this graph. But you know, it's uh, pretty impressive, okay? Um, all right. Um, somebody was talking about the Middle Ages, okay. So thank you for uh, setting up this particular slide. Uh, how many have seen this particular series in Netflix? Anyone? Okay, one, all right. Uh, so, uh, it's actually a fairly good series, although uh, you know somewhat uh, kind of uh, romanticized for dramatic effect, uh, with Dustin Hoffman playing the role of uh, you know the grand old man of the Medici family. So the Medici family used to be one of the banking families of medieval Florence in Italy. Okay, now uh, at the time they started, when the grand old man Cosimo Medici, uh, you know started the whole thing, they were just one out of many families with similar wealth. All of them were, you know, doing roughly the same thing. And then, over a course of two centuries, well, actually, just a century, actually, the Medici's became the ruling power of Florence. So they were actually, uh, so Medici, uh, the Florence was, you know, technically republic, so, but they were effectively calling the shots. And after some point, you know, they just did away with the pretense and they just became the, not only the de, de facto, but also the de jure rulers, okay? And then the Medici's, in fact, uh, were a power all the way until almost close to, I think, uh, the 18th century, okay? And so the question is, what led to this one particular banking family to become so powerful in so short a time? So if you look at the Netflix series, of course, uh, they will have their own take. Uh, I can't resist playing just the trailer. So you'll see all kinds of dramatic effects, like, you know, uh, oh, oh, unfortunately, the sound is not there. I, I don't know why. Maybe the, okay, the sound is completely on, but, uh, you know. Anyway, probably for the best. Okay, doesn't matter. Anyway, so if you look at the Netflix series, you'd see a lot of intrigue and you know people killing each other, and people having you know what do you call it? crisis, personal crisis, uh, ethical crisis, and so on. Uh, very dramatic. Uh, but there's a lot more mundane explanation given to this rise by the sociologist. Paget. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is basically my uh, rendering in graphs of the data taken from uh, John Paget's '93 paper on the rise of the Medici. Uh, so, these are all the various banking families which were powerful in Florence at the time that Cosimo Medici. 
uh, basically started his bank. Okay? So what do you notice? So you notice that the Medici are basically forming a very dense set of interrelations with the other families such that they are central to this entire group. And they do it by various means. So they form marriage relations with certain families, but no business ties. On the other hand, they have business ties with certain families, but no marriage relations. And with some, they have both. Okay? Now, uh, there's also yet another level. So they even had what is known as political patronage. Okay? So if you want to go to the Sinori, which is like the parliament, you had to get you know, a letter, a reference letter from some of the other families. And uh, Medici would provide record letters to some of these families. Okay? So you have these three different networks, one of marriage ties, one of business relations, one of patronage. Now, interestingly, in none of these individual networks are Medici any particularly important. But if you collapse all of these networks together, you suddenly find the Medici are the center. They are the one who are connecting all these families. So if, let's say, the Barbadori family wants to influence the Tornabuoni family, the intermediary would be the Medici. Okay? And by a system of very strategically forming this business ties, marriage relation, and patronage, Cosimo and subsequently Lorenzo managed to cement the centrality of the Medici family. Okay? Uh, again, I was telling my undergraduates that you know, if you think about it, uh, current Indian scenario gives you a fantastic parallel, right? I won't name the family, but you can see how they're doing political patronage, how they are forming marriage relations okay, with other influential industrial houses, and finally, how they're doing business with families with whom they have no marriage ties, because that'd be a conflict of interest, right? You don't want to gobble up someone's company if that, com that company's son is married to your daughter, right? right? So you can see how this is coming in action even in today's India. All right, and then you have uh, this whole lot of technological networks, like if you're looking at air transportation, railway transportation, if you look at power transmission, if you look at how you know, information is propagated across the World Wide Web, or in all of these cases, you have networks coming into picture. So I uh, just wanted to end, because you know, I have a particular assignment which is connected with this, that using the concept of network, uh, in fact, the whole science of graph theory to some extent started with this original problem. So this is the famous Leonard Euler <coughs> of um, mm, fame, is, uh, you know, Eulerian fame. Um, so he used to uh, live for a time in the city of Konigsberg, which is, of course, I think now known as Kaliningrad. Um, uh, so Konigsberg at that time was part of Prussia. And at that time, there were seven bridges which crossed the river Pregel, which flowed through it. Now, this it divided the town into four parts, the island A, and this three B, C, and D parts. And a puzzle that often people talked about who were residents of Konigsberg was, can you actually walk through the city such that you would cross each bridge once and once only? So can you actually go through, you know, uh, can you just, can you design a tour such that, you know, you would go through these bridges such that you finish your walk by walking through each bridge once and once only? Right? So you can, of course, try to do it with a pencil and paper, okay? You, you can try, like, for example, I'll go through here, 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 sorry, A, B, F, C, then this one, this one, and then you're blocked, right? Because you can't use C again. So how do I cross G? So, okay, that route is not possible. 
Can I do something else? Well, you can try doing this, but Euler had a better way. Okay, so Euler said, well, um, let me convert it into a more abstract form. So now, the nodes are basically the various land masses, A, B, C, and D, and the bridges correspond to the edges connecting them. Okay? So the question, does there exist any walking route that crosses all seven bridges exactly once each, now reduces to finding a so-called Eulerian path, which is a path that goes through each link in a network exactly once on this network. Okay? Now, Euler gave a fantastic argument. Euler said that, look, in order to solve, in order to, if, if an answer exists to this question, that means every node you must once enter and once exit, right? So that means it has to have an even number of links because you have one entry, one exit. So it can be two, it can be four, it can be six, and so on, except two nodes, the one where you start and the one where you end, okay? Right? So those can have a odd number of links. And so an answer to this question will be yes if there are at most two nodes which has odd number of links. So let's count. C has three no links, D has three links, B has three links, A has five links. So you can conclude that there is no such path possible. That's a brilliant way of solving this problem without having to go through all the ways of you know, solving this network problem. And so this is basically the start of network science, you might say. So this is how graph theory started. And uh, Euler said that you, know, you can actually generalize this, you know, these kinds of structures where you basically study pairwise relations between objects. Okay. From there, we have come a long way where we have started using network science to search the World Wide Web. Okay. So when, w, when the World Wide Web was first proposed, uh, it was thought that it would be completely useless because you, know, you have so much data, but how do you find you know, the one thing that you're looking for? So it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack, right? I mean, huge, huge files all over the world. You know, you'll be lucky to find what you want. And, and you can see how the number of wave pages has been actually growing over time. Until, of course, Google came. Okay? And um, they kind of made this manually indexed search engine's history. Okay? Now, what they did was they used network science. Okay? So they essentially said, look, can we rank these pages in terms of their importance? Okay? Importance with respect to the entire network. So how do you measure the importance of a network? So one way is, of course, to say, how many other nodes does a particular node know? In other words, how many nodes are connecting to a particular node? So you know, like uh, the degree. So this is what we call the degree of a node, or the number of connections that a node has with other nodes. So you could have in degree in a directed network. You could have in degree, that is the number of connections which are coming to a node, or a out degree, number of connections which are going out of your node. But the problem with using this measure is that. You could actually form a cartel with your friends such that you say, okay, everyone, you connect to my page, I will connect to your page. And in fact, there are, in fact, uh, you know, pages which say that, you know, please connect to my page, I will, you know, connect to your page and so on. So this is one way to bias the system. Instead, Google asked, it's not just how many you know, it's who you know. Okay. So how many important pages link to you? Now, that, of course, means that it's almost like a circular definition, right? Your importance is based on how many important pages link to you, but then how do you actually measure importance in the first place? Fortunately for us, using linear algebra, you can actually frame this supposedly circular question into mathematical form. And you can use what is known as eigenvector centrality. Okay, so this is going to be the last thing before uh, we end, promise. Uh, sorry about going out of time. So um, I'll probably go through this in detail later, but 
it, it kind of goes like this. So you just say that each node i is given a particular important score. Let's call it x, x subscript i. And this will change over time. So you know, this is the initial important score. And let's say you know, initially everybody is given the same score, 1, for example. Okay? Now, you do this estimation of importance iteratively. So what you do is you say that, OK, your importance is based upon how many important nodes are connected to you. So basically, if you ask how many nodes are connected to you, you just look at your adjacency matrix. So if your adjacency matrix is 1, that means this particular node is connected to you. And so this particular node's importance would be added to your score. All right? So in matrix notation, you just simply write that the updated importance of this node would be the product of the agency matrix times the initial importance vector. So you repeat this again and again. Okay, so after t such steps, your importance would be a raised to the power t. Remember, a is the agency matrix times the initial values for the importances, which is just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay? Now you can express this as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. Let's call them vi of the agency matrix. So I can write it as a to the power t summation i ci vi. Now this a uh, raised to t vi essentially becomes an eigenvalue problem, right? So a times vi is going to give rise to lambda i times vi. So it's simply, you know, eigenvalues of a. And since this is raised to the power t, this will give you lambda i raised to the power t. Remember, lambda i is the ith eigenvalue of the agency matrix. Now, I can express this in terms of, so I can take lambda 1, which is the largest eigenvalue of A outside and express all other eigenvalues of ratio of the ith eigenvalue to the largest eigenvalue. Why do I do that? Because I will show that when I make T very large, so you know if I keep doing this process, then lambda I by lambda 1 will tend to 0 for all lambda I which is not 1, which is, uh, which is not lambda 1, okay? Because lambda 1 is the largest one. So this ratio is always less than 1. And so all the other entries will tend to 0. And you will have essentially the solution of this as the, the corresponding eigenvalue equation. And so the final uh, importance would simply be the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of the agency matrix. All right? Now, you might say, OK, this is way too complicated. There's a simpler way, which is you just use what is known as a random surfer model. You start from a node, and you use a random walker to basically keep walking along the network. Every time when you come to a node, you randomly pick any one of the links which are coming out of it and basically keep walking. After many uh, such walks, you ask, OK, how many times was node A visited? How many times was node B visited? How many times was node C visited? So the relative fraction of the times you visited each of these nodes will give the relative importance. Okay? So uh, there's a very nice video on uh, YouTube which actually explains this, which I won't go through because of lack of time. Now, uh, I promised to say you know, that uh, how do you go beyond a network? So there are limitations to network. For one, it only looks at pairwise relations. Okay, so how do you go beyond pairwise? Okay, so we know that there are many relations which tend to get altered in the presence of a third individual. Okay, so you and I are talking very nicely, and suddenly, well, uh, two of my PhD students are talking, you know, uh, a lot, and then suddenly I come across, and suddenly the conversation changes. Okay, uh, so you, we know that you know these kinds of things happen. So um, how do you actually describe this? So computer scientists have been doing this a long time. So they generalized networks by a generalized link which connects more than two nodes. And this is called a hypergraph. So a hyperedge is a generalized link which basically couples multiple nodes. So for example, take a look at this. Here, one hyperedge corresponds to 
the set A, C, D. Another hyperedge connects C, D, E. Another hyperedge connects P and D. So you can represent this using what is known as a bipartite network. So here, bipartite networks are basically networks where the links exist only between nodes of different types. So here, these nodes correspond to the original nodes of the network, and these nodes correspond to a hyperedge. So this is one hyperedge, this is another hyperedge, and this is one another hyperedge. So this hyperedge connects A, C, D. This hyperedge connects B and D, and this hyperedge connects C, D, and E. So in this way, you can actually represent relations which involve more than two individuals at a time. This, uh, can I just finish this and then you can ask me. Uh, and there's another way you can also generalize network, which is I already alluded to. You can have multiple types of networks all occurring in the same space. So, you know, sometimes uh, you hear multiplex networks, sometimes you hear interdependent networks. They're not exactly the same. So multiplex networks are where you could have the same nodes occurring across various layers. So the Medici family network, for example. They're the nodes where all the families, but the links were all different. So in one case, the links were marriage ties, in another case, business relations, in another case, patronage. So that's a multiplex network. But an interdependent network is where the nodes could be actually different, but they have different kinds of relations within a network and between networks, for example. So here is an example from the cell. So the cell actually consists of a large number of various kinds of relations. So there is protein-protein interaction network, this metabolic network, this gene regulatory network, the cell signaling, and these are all interrelated. Okay? So how do you study such multilayer networks it has been a growth area over the last 10 years or so. So let me just uh, finish by you know, uh, giving you a list of readings. So this is the best textbook on networks uh, at the moment, Newman's Networks and Introduction, uh, currently in its second edition. Uh, and for uh, the dynamics on networks, actually Bharat Bartholomew Vas and Vespinani's book is also pretty nice. So I primarily use these two books for you know, um, creating my lectures. There are uh, there's another book by Alon uh, called Introduction to Systems Biology and also a YouTube videos of the course that he gave. Uh, I don't tend to use it too much, but if you're into uh, using networks for biology, uh, that may be a good book to look at. Uh, then comes a series of introductory papers and review papers, which you can take a look at. Many of these papers are actually collected in this edited volume by Newman, Barabashi, and Watts, called The Structure and Dynamics and Networks. And finally, two popular books, Duncan Watts's Six Degrees and Barabashi's Linked. Uh, I, like, I love popular books because you know, they tend to give you a very quick roundup of a new new science. So when I first want to get into a new science, I tend to read the popular book because they may get some of the details wrong, but it gives you the overall picture. So these are actually, one, what's this six degrees is actually a fantastic book if you want to learn about you know, what networks are useful for. Okay, and uh, finally, I uh, have a assignment for you to do over uh, this evening. So what I will do is I will, so this, you know, along the lines of the bridges of Konigsberg, these are the 10 bridges of Chennai, and I have some questions. So what I'll do is I'll mail this to uh, Obishek, and uh, Obishek will mail the PDF of this uh, assignment to you. So tomorrow I will uh, give you the answers. So I hopefully, you know, you'll spend some time this evening um, trying to work this out a bit. All right, uh, so thank you, and uh, apologies for going 15 minutes over time. So somebody had a question, uh, yeah. Did, yeah.
Is this okay? The title of my lecture, uh, the topic that I was planning to teach is bacterial chemotaxis. Now this is a topic related to biology and I believe uh, among many of you, some of you, uh, I mean people here, they have different level of familiarity in biology and different level of interests in biology. Some of you may already been working on some biologically related systems for your PhD. Some of you may have stopped any connection with biology since before high school and promised never to uh, even look at any biological terms again. So can I uh, see a raise of hands, like show of hands? So how many of you are working on some biologically related systems for your thesis? One, two, three, four, five, okay. And how many of you have uh, done some basic course on systems biology? One, two, three, okay, even, okay, fine. So what I wa wanted to do, therefore, uh, because people uh, come here from a heterogeneous background, particularly in biology, so I, uh, instead of directly launching into bacterial chemotaxis and uh, flood you with lot of biological information, I first wanted to uh, develop, or wanted to tell you about some general principles which actually govern a lot of different biological systems. Seemingly different systems like bacterial chemotaxis, like gene regulation, like some ion transport, they are, it is possible to identify some general principles which are actually um, working in all these systems. So therefore, I will uh, start I will try to develop a general formalism and then I will introduce the topic of chemotaxis as a manifestation of that. <clears throat> so first we have to clear up some terminologies. So we start with what is a cell? So for the purpose of this lecture, cell can be a lot of things, for the purpose of this lecture, we will think of cell as an integrated device which is made of so, um, cell, we can think of it as a collection of several thousand types of interacting proteins. I believe everybody knows what proteins are. Again, I mean you have heard, must have heard this term before. Again, for the purpose of this talk, we will consider protein as, you can think of them as a tiny molecular machine which are designed to perform one specific task. And it can perform that specific task very efficiently. Just to give you an idea, and in, in a cell, different types of proteins are present in different concentration. Some proteins are present, there is only few molecules of some proteins. And then there are some proteins which are present uh, as several thousand molecules. For example, for an E. coli cell, there are 4,000 different types of proteins and total number of protein molecules is of the order of few millions. So these few million protein molecules or 4,000 different types of proteins, they are interacting among each other and we will consider the cell as a kind of platform where they do it. How does a cell function? So again, uh, a cell is all the time receiving lot of inputs, input signal from extracellular environment, also from intracellular environment. Uh, for example, um, I mean, among the um, type of 
signal it is receiving from outside the cell. This, these signals are of the type physical, chemical, and biological. Examples are, for example, physical signals. What are the type of physical signals possible? For, for example, you put the cell in some medium, and then the temperature of the medium is changing, suppose. Or pressure is changing. Um, chemical signal could be, that is actually one example that we will discuss in detail, uh, as seen in the case of chemotaxis. You can find a cell in presence of term, some toxic chemical or in presence of some food, nutrient. Biological signals could be, it is receiving some kind of signal from other cells. Now, what a cell needs to do, it receives those signals and then it responds to it. And that response is actually executed by these proteins. There can be chem signals coming from inside the cell also. For example, suppose, um, there is accidentally some membrane damage for a cell. Then the correct kind of response would be, if that damage is repairable, then the cell would like to produce a certain type of proteins, which are specialist in repairing damaged membranes. Okay. Res in response to some toxic chemical, the chemical signal that I was talking about, in response to those uh, toxic chemical, you can intuitively understand cell would like to swim away go away from that toxic environment as much as possible. Similarly, uh, as chemotaxis works, if you place E. coli in an environment where you have um, uh, created some trail of nutrient, then the cell is known to follow the trail of nutrient and go towards the region where there is large number of nutrient present. So therefore, <clears throat> in this case, the um, kind of response the cell needs to give is motility. I mean, it senses something in the environment, then it uh, follow, I mean, uh, changes its motility response uh, for that. <clears throat> now, some of the risk, some ty these different types of response are there, which also involve different types of proteins. Some of the response needs the cell to produce a certain type of proteins. Like I ex uh, gave the example of membrane damage that when, I mean, although there is all these different types of proteins, not all of them are present in the cell all the time. If a membrane is damaged, then the specific type of proteins that I need, I don't have any use of them if the membrane is intact. So therefore, for a healthy cell, completely healthy cell, those proteins are of no use. Because remember, the proteins have very specific task. So therefore, if the cell senses some membrane damage, it would like to produce, sometimes the response is it would like to produce the correct type of proteins and those proteins then can come and do the specific task they are assigned to do. And this uh, thing, this process is controlled by uh, transcription. Right now, we mainly have sensory transcription in mind, which means in response to some input signal, certain types of proteins are generated, and then they um, do some work. <clears throat> okay, the question is, how the input signal is transmitted into the cell? So for that also, we have very special type of proteins, which can be present in two different states, active and inactive. In response to some uh, signal, uh, to the appropriate signal, they switch to the active state. These proteins are called transcription factors or TF in short. <clears throat> so these transcription factors in presence of some signal quickly switch to their active conformation and in the active state they can bind to the target gene 
and they can um, regulate production of specific proteins. So I've used a lot of um, words here. So I would like to also um, uh, define some terminologies. So uh, let me, so what are genes? For the purpose of this lecture, you know, every cell has a DNA. So DNA is a long ribbon-like object. And then there is a particular segment of DNA. Lot of such segments are there actually. Some segments of DNA, they are known as genes, which co contain all the information needed to produce a specific type of proteins. On a DNA, we would like to use this symbol to denote start of a DNA sequence. And the start of a gene sequence. So this is, this represents a gene. Just before the genetic sequence start, along the DNA, there is one portion which is known as the promoter of that gene. In that promoter, there is a special site on which the active transcription factor can come and bind. When they do so, they initiate the process of protein production. I will not go into the details of this transcription process, uh, so to speak, but let me just briefly tell you that on the promoter side, there is also another special site in the promoter region where another object called RNA polymerase can come and bind to it. So this is for transcription factor, this block, and this block is for RNA polymerase. When they bind to the gene in the bound state, they switch to their open conformation. That means in that state, it is able to zip through the genetic sequence, reads the information that is there in some code, and then it transcribes mRNA. And that, MR, that mRNA actually contains this information in some, the transcript of the gene. And then that mRNA goes ahead, translates, gets translated into protein. So this, even if you don't remember all the details, it's okay. But uh, the main thing is when the transcription factor comes and binds, it controls the binding affinity of RNA polymerase to the promoter region of the gene. Certain transcription factors can enhance the rate of binding of RNA polymerase. When more and more RNA polymerase is coming and binding to the gene, they will produce protein at a higher rate. Okay. And Sometimes transcription factor can inhibit an RNA polymerase to come and bind. Then the protein production will stop. Okay. Yes. They are proteins, yes. And they are specific proteins. Yes. Uh, uh, transcription factors, yeah, I will sh discuss all these later. A transcription factor can uh, um, regulate a set of target genes also. It doesn't necessarily have to be one-to-one. -one. And same for RNA polymerase also. They have the ability to read a genetic sequence and uh, produce mRNA. Okay. <clears throat> so therefore, there are two different types of um, control that the transcription factor, uh, okay, so sorry, what I was want, uh, trying to say, if, if a transcription factor is blocking an RNA polymerase from coming and binding here, that sometimes it could be that it somehow after in the bound state, it chemically modifies this thing, this um, rearrangement, such that RNA polymerase cannot come and bind. Sometimes it even offers steric hindrance, and such that this part becomes specially inaccessible to an RNA polymerase, whatever it is. That if, if it is not possible for RNA polymerase to come and bind, that uh, it cannot read the genetic sequence, protein production cannot happen. On the other hand, if it, it is binding to this at a large rate, then proteins are being produced also at a large rate. So therefore, there are two types of control a transcription factor can exert over its target gene. One is called activation, another is called repression. Activation, another is called repression.
sometimes pro I mean a gene is producing uh, achha, let me draw the diagram maybe that will make it a little bit more clear uh, a gene is producing the proteins now those proteins remember those proteins can in turn be another transcription factor which goes ahead binds to the promoter region of another gene and regulates its protein production so this way we, uh, it is possible to form a sensory transcription network inside the cell. Now in the pre yes. Uh, do you see uh, activation of the cell from transcription factor sensor inside the cell when the uh, robotic layer of the polymerase divides and the other one of the role is not getting by? So mm -hmm. when you say activation, do you mean it is with respect to the role of the transcription polymerase? that it is doing what it is supposed to do or is it does it mean that or does activation always mean uh, transcription uh, uh, no transcription is uh, sorry activation means it increases the rate binding affinity of rna polymerase to this point okay which means at a larger rate uh, this is this um, uh, protein uh, production process is being initiated that is activation Sometimes it is the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. If the transcription factor is bound, mm -hmm. it stops the RNA polymerase from mm -hmm. binding here. If the RNA polymer, because transcription factor is not going to uh, produce the protein for you. Uh, that for that it needs RNA polymerase. And if it is stopping it from binding here, then uh, protein production will not happen. Okay. Or may happen with some very small rate if okay. the system is leaky. Mm -hmm. We will come to that later. Okay. Thank okay? you. So, uh, I mean, given the fact that some of the proteins which are being produced are themselves transcription factor, they can go and regulate other genes. Therefore, we have, we can define a set of sensory transcription network inside the cell. Now, in the previous lecture, Shita Broda has talked a lot about uh, networks. Uh, we will use some of the uh, definitions he has used, some of the things he have already told you. So as you have uh, seen in his lecture that a network is defined as a set of, defined by set of nodes and edges. And here in the sensory transcription network, nodes are like genes. And edges are like this regulation interaction. So if I have a link like, which is x and these edges are directed also, x arrow y. This means that transcription factor x goes and binds to the promoter region of gene y and regulates the protein production by that gene. If I, uh, so let me just um, draw it once more. Suppose this is the DNA, this is <coughs> gene Y, this is one special site and I, yeah, I have this X, transcription factor X goes to X star. This is the inactive state, this is the active state and X can convert to X star and this is aided by presence of a certain input signal, I call it SX. SX is the signal it is receiving, which made it decide, okay, now it's time to produce some protein Y and let them do what they are designed to do. The opposite movement, opposite reaction is also possible, opposite uh, transition, that from active to inactive switch. Both the transitions are happening simultaneously. It's a highly dynamical process. But presence of input signal ensures that um, this state is favored, extra st the active state is favored. In the active state, the transcription factor will come and bind to this special site in the promoter of gene Y. Then there is another site which is binding the RNA polymerase. Is it too small, the font size? Can you see at the back? Okay, you are wearing your specs sitting at the front row, so I have to <laughs> clearly increase the font size. Okay. Yes. Just one second. Let me finish the diagram. Just, just one second. 
And then uh, if it is an activation type of interaction, that means a lot of proteins are being generated. Like this. Yes. There was a uh, question. Ma'am. Uh, here. Uh, so X is the site at which the, uh, the transcription factor. X is not the site. Okay. X is the transcription factor itself. Right. It cannot bind to any region in the promoter. There is a special site for, at which it can come and bind if and only if it is in the active state. Yes. Uh, so X is a gene. X that, is not a gene. X is a protein. Site. It's a product of a gene. Uh, right, uh, but the nodes are genes, right? And uh, edge can be okay, only between... Okay, okay, th that's a good question. In fact, X is a transcription factor. When I say that's right, nodes are genes. So this means product of gene X. Right. The gene X also, product of gene X, I call it protein X. So product of gene X, right. which I denote as protein right. X, is ac acting as a transcription factor to protein production for gene Y. So the, you see, this is gene Y. It is generating proteins, which I am calling Y. Okay. Uh, so X and Ys are the proteins. proteins generated by gene X and Ys. I mean the corresponding. Gene X and Y respectively. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. After only you have this X start and only we have this no no. I'm saying this. This RNA protein also comes and binds, right? So it only binds if the X star is there on that promoter okay. side. That's a good question. If if it is an activation type of interaction, then yes. Okay. If it is a repression type of interaction, then the opposite is true. This site has to be free of X star for okay. RNA polymerase to come and bind here. Okay. okay. And one RNA, RNA polymer can generate multiple yeah, so w w what sometimes happens, I don't know too much of this uh, biological detail, but what sometimes happens is uh, along the DNA, DNA, you see multiple RNA polymerase processing it at the same time. Okay. Okay. And this arrow signifies that it only reads from one side, is it? This uh, yes. X regulates Y, but not no, the other way around. Uh, this arrow? No, no. This arrow. No, no, that gene you put it like an arrow, ha, right? Ha, so ha. It, it, it represents that you reach from one side to another. That's or? right. Okay. It is one is called a three prime terminal and the five prime, but I now, right now I don't remember which one is which. So it is, as you cannot read it from the other end. Yes. Ma'am, I'm saying that uh, as the X keeps on the gene wise, it's active gene, uh, protein polymer, and the RNA polymer, polymer is excited and gene uh, protein wise. Yes, if it is a transcription factor, then it can maybe regulate the transcription for Z. Then I have another node, Y goes to Z, another edge. So can it sit on X? Can it sit on? Can it sit on in the, the, the gene Y sit protein Y? Oh, you are saying whether a gene can be auto-regulated. Yes, the answer is yes, and we will actually discuss that in detail. The product of a gene can sometimes act as its own transcription factor. That is possible, yes. Any other questions? Yes. factors. So if that transcription factor site is like uh, unoccupied, so then these RNAs are producing genes, right? And right. So if, other, that's if it is occupied, then it cannot. Okay. Sometimes it is as simple as that. This uh, a X star would simply sit like a fat person and completely block the access of the correct binding site to the RNA polymerase. So it cannot come. Sometimes it can be also chemical modification. Okay. Yes, any other questions? Okay. Okay, then finally, so I have also said that uh, you, in using these nodes as genes and edges, directed edges which um, uh, represent the regulation, the interaction between the two genes, you can form a network. And um, there is another uh, last thing that I would like to mention is about separation of time scale. So you see the transcription phenomena, it's pretty complicated. First of all, a signal comes, there are a lot of steps involved. There is signal comes, input signal, it <coughs> favors 
inactive to active transition for the transcription factor. That transcription factor in the active state will come and bind to the uh, promoter region of gene Y and it will either enhance or stop binding of RNA polymerase to the same promoter region. Then the uh, uh, transcription will start and finally the proteins will be produced. So there are different time scales associated with these processes. First, the signal binds, changes its to active conformation and this thing, this is happening very fast. The time scale for this is of the order of milliseconds. This is the almost the fastest process in the whole transcription network. Then the active transcription factor will come and bind to the promoter region of the target gene. That happens over a time scale of second. Then RNA polymerase will come and bind, it will zip through the gene, it will create the mRNA, that mRNA will get translated and uh, so these things, transcription and translation of the gene, it takes of the order of few minutes. Finally, the protein production starts and here we ask how long does it take for the protein to reach 50% of its final concentration. So you know at the cell whether a protein is functional or not that depends a lot on its level. Protein levels are extremely important. Often we will see that only when the protein is at an optimal level it can do what is it supposed to do. So if you ask the question how long does it take for the protein to reach 50% of its uh, uh, final value, that time scale can be often about hour. So you see we have millisecond, we have second, we have minute, we have hour. This separation of time scale is actually mathematically making my life easier for me because if I am interested in writing down time evolution equation for protein concentration, then on that slow time scale I can assume all these other processes are in steady state. Everybody understands the meaning of this statement? That if you are in a slow process, other faster things will be on steady state? Okay. translated into protein. That is the longest time. That is the longest time. Uh, okay. So yes. here everything is fast on the yeah. DNA. Compared to that everything is faster. <coughs> okay. Mm. So activator repressor. Huh. So another thing, activator repressor I have already talked about. When I finally present it in a network, I will also, just one second. When I finally present it in a network, I will also sometimes use the um, symbol plus, let me write it here, plus and minus to represent an activation or repression type of interaction along the edges. So the edges in the transcription network are also signed, plus or minus. So, um, and typically it has been observed that in a biological system there is roughly equal number of plus and minus uh, signs. Yes, there were questions. For example, let's say there is a protein X. Is that the transcription factor for all the proteins or is it a transcription factor for a certain set of proteins? Certain set of proteins. Okay, so there, so so there are one transcription factor can only bind to a set of target genes. Sometimes it can only bind to perhaps one target gene. Sometimes it's a family of target genes. Okay. And those target genes will create different types of proteins. All right. Okay. Thanks. So in other words, in a network, um, I mean, if you remember what Shita Bhruta told us, in a network from one node, which is, um, okay, nodes, I'm calling them transcription, I mean, gene X produces protein X, gene Y produces protein Y. So when I say X, Y, sometimes I mean gene, sometimes I mean transcription factor, because those are, I mean, one to one. So uh, sometimes some nodes are coming out, from some links are coming out, which are from one node, a link can join different types of different, various different nodes. That is the question you are asking. Any other question? Okay, I think, uh, uh, because we don't have a cell 
connection of Hindu Muslims, right? I think that here was one of the points he said. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, but here we can here have self connections. Possible. Here also, it is right? possible. Auto regulation, we call it. Any other question? Yes. Like, ma'am, you said, like, uh, maybe use the microphone, people behind you cannot hear. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so ma'am, you said like uh, everything looks like in a steady state when something is very slow. So that means like if no, like no, everything else looks like in a steady state. Oh, I mean like uh, one of the process should be slow. The, what, what from the, the if I am only interested in the slow process, mm -hmm. then just, all the other fast processes seem like they are in a steady state. You are sitting here right now. Yes. These lights, they are flickering all the time, but that is happening at a much faster time scale. Yeah, so that so you see an sense an average effect. Oh, that's, that's all. That's all. Yes. Any yes. <coughs> Intuitively, that is clear why, right? <coughs> okay. Then uh, another uh, thing is input functions. So. What we will do, I mean, or when we write down the time evolution equation for these protein uh, concentrations, we do not take into, we do not explicitly describe all these intermediate steps. When we say X regulates Y, we mean that rate of production of Y is a function of X star. That's all. I'm simplifying it, although there are all these intermediate steps. I'm not considering any of it. I'm just saying rate of production of Y is a function of active concentration of X. What kind of function it is? That depends on whether it is an activator or whether it is a repressor. If it is an activator, then experimentally people have determined these functions and it turns out that it has, um, it can be pretty well described by Hill curve or Hill function. So for activator, f x star, this is the rate of production of y, has the form beta x star to the n divided by k to the n plus x star to the n. Okay. So, uh, here, this is, if you plot it, so you can see it from here, if x star is very small, then you can neglect this plus x star to the n here. So now you get beta x star by k whole to the n. In the limit when x star is very, very smaller than k, then f x star is almost 0. In the limit when x star is very large, then you can neglect this k to the n term. x star n gets cancelled and you get f x star is beta. So for small x star, f x star has the value 0 and for large x star, it has the maximum value 1. It is an S-shaped curve. It is called a Hill function. This was experimentally measured and people found that this form actually describes the um, experimental observation pretty well. So just um, K, K is called the activation coefficient. Beta is called the maximal expression level because that is the maximum maximum value reached by this input function. And n is called the Hill coefficient. Uh, if n is large versus if n is small, what can you say about the steepness of the curve? Anyone? Suppose n is very large, 1000. Will that curve be steeper or if n is small, like 10, will that curve be? Very good. <coughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, so actually what happens in mathematical analysis, people often assume n is infinitely large and replace this Hill function by a step function. So I'll come to that in a moment. But just um, that is a mathematical simplicity. But um, actually in, for most organisms, Hill coefficient is known to lie between 1 and 4. 
but we are not trying to be very quantitatively accurate here. And what turns out, even if you replace it by an actual step function, your predictions are not too different from what you actually expect. This is for activation and for repression, similarly, uh, you get that is beta by 1 plus x star by k whole to the n. So, this is a decreasing hill curve. Okay? So, now as I was saying that we will assume that uh, or it is generally assumed that n is very large such that I can um, replace it by some step function. So, uh, let us say um, I would like to then write f x star is so this one I can write it as beta times theta x star greater than k. Similarly, this one I can write as beta times theta x star less than k. <clears throat> so, therefore, there are only two possible values of this input function, either 0 or beta. And therefore, which means a gene can be in two different states, either on or off. Only these two possibilities are there. Sometimes it is possible that some particular gene is regulated by multiple transcription factors. So, then also one can ask the question what kind of regulation it is. So, clearly promoter region of that gene has two different sites where two different transcription factors should come and bind. So, suppose if I have a um, input function which has this form f x star comma y star. <clears throat> then I can, there are two different possibilities. One is I need both x star and y star bound to the promoter such that the gene can be uh, turned on. So, this is, then this is written as beta theta x star larger than k or k x times theta y star larger than k y. This is called an AND type of interaction. I think the reason is obvious. There is similarly an odd type of interaction which says that any one of the transcription factors can come and bind and only then the gene can be on. Then I will, uh, it is uh, written as for an odd type of interaction, it is written as um, beta theta x star less than k x or y star less than k y. Any questions? Let me just check if I have covered everything. Uh, excuse me. I yes. Was, I was wondering what is the kind of interaction between the gene and the transcription factor and the RNA polymerase, uh, the kind? Of the order of seconds. The uh, kind of interaction, is it a non-covalent or is it uh, the, um, is it relevant to this? It is, I, um, I think it is a covalent interaction. If I, but I, I, I don't know too much of, I, I can look it up and tell you perhaps, but uh, all I know that it comes and binds. And sometimes it performs covalent modification of this site to stop from an RNA polymerase to come and bind or to enhance its binding affinity. That I know. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so just another information. We mentioned that about e, e. coli cell has about 4,000 different proteins. Out of these 4,000 different proteins, 300 of them are transcription factors. So this will give you some uh, other proteins are, they are not transcription factors. They just signaling molecules. They take part in reactions, etc. So this will give you an idea about the, what kind of numbers we are talking about. Mm, I think we, yeah, I think I covered... Okay.
next i will huh, so now this we have this transcription uh, network that i was talking about now if you actually look at people have by, uh, experimentally mapped out the whole network systematically but if you actually look at those networks it is it looks extremely complicated you see there are 300 transcription factors and then uh, they are connected to each other many different these they can actually uh, control many different genes and they are connected to each other in a very complicated way so if you just look at the network it looks something really complicated but then to then the question is okay i mean uh, how do we understand such a network so for that we would like to define one thing which is called network motif so let that is the next part i want to cover shita prada are you planning to talk about network motif in your talk okay yes hopefully so okay <clears throat> what is a network motif even if you look at a network which is super complicated i mean looking very weird and messy and all that if you look at it closely you can still find some basic building blocks or some basic patterns which are repeating itself quite a large number of times in different regions of that network okay the thing is okay uh, and if if it is so if a network if a particular pattern is being repeated over and over in the network if you also find it in other organisms also typically we do then it is called a network motif the thing is when it is being repeated there must be some reason behind it there must be some advantage of having that particular kind of structure so many times for that first we have to quantify what do we mean by it is being repeated very frequently compared to what what do we know that okay this is a large enough number large enough frequency so we compare that with a random network so suppose e coli um, uh, transcription network we are talking about or any other um, uh, network which has n nodes and e edges connecting the nodes clear random network means i will form another network where i put same number of nodes same number of edges but now edges are put at random and then in that random network i count how many times do i find that particular motif if the actual biological system contains that motif a significantly larger amount number of times compared to what you would expect in a random network then you call it a network motif now uh, notice one thing that why why it is important okay maybe this is frequent <coughs> seen frequently maybe it is an accident so why we give, are we putting so much of importance why do we think it is um, evolutionary advantageous and all that because you see networks in a uh, sensory transcription network um, edges in a sensory transcription network can get created or annihilated at random because of a process called mutation so what is mutation it you know what is mutation right we have all heard about mutation during the pandemic times quite often so when a dna is being replicated then sometimes you may read one particular letter wrong so when you are decoding a gene you may read one particular letter wrong so the kind of protein that you would produce <coughs> would be different from what you were meant to produce it can happen accidentally but you see now that protein may not act as a transcription factor to some particular gene maybe earlier in the if you had not made a mistake there was a perhaps there was a connection between node x and node y but while creating Uh, the transcription factor from x maybe you made some mistake and you created something little bit different but that doesn't act as a transcription factor to y anymore so then that particular edge is lost 
Similarly, you can create some protein which can sit and bind to promoter regions of some genes which was earlier not possible. So then a new age can be created. Now, sometimes we think that mutation is a very rare process. Why bother about something which, I mean, which rates are so slow, so low. But uh, as I will show from an example that because of the sheer large number of times a DNA gets replicated, even a very, um, I mean, even a process like mutation, which is, which is associated with low probability, can still give rise to a lot of um, different effects. And we had all seen that during pandemic times, right? I mean, uh, mutations, uh, new, new mutations kept on coming. So uh, just to give an example, suppose <coughs> if you place a single bacterial cell cell in 10 milliliter of nutrient. Then within less than 24 hours, less than a day, it will form a bacterial colony which consists of about 10 to the 10 number of cells. Okay. Now, which means a single DNA has been replicated 10 to the 10 number of times. That's a very large number. And all this is available within less than 24 hours. And if the mutation rate is of the order of 10 to the minus 9 per letter <coughs> per replication, then you already see that in this population, I have 10 different cells with a mutation in one particular letter. Okay, that is, and all this, and so which means in those 10 cells, <coughs> probably the um, age connectivity of transcription network is also different. If I have made a mistake in creating one particular transcription factor, uh, and then it is now forming its own edges or deleting some of the edges which were earlier there. So therefore, uh, I mean, the main point that I was trying to say is that um, because of mutation, when DNA is being replicated, these network stru structures are changing all the time. Despite that, if I continue to find the same building block over and over, over and over, then there must be some evolutionary advantage because it is kind of surviving against this randomization force, okay? So what we will do, we will um, <coughs> identify few network motifs which are present in sensory transcription network and uh, we will try to study them. We will try to see what are their advantages. The reason for doing so is these network motifs are found in many different types of cells, <coughs> in many different types of networks. So therefore, once we understand their um, advantage, it will be easier for us to interpret how they can uh, influence the um, function, um, functioning of other networks, particularly what I eventually want to talk about, signal transduction network of <coughs> bacterial chemotaxis. <coughs> okay, so first we have to calculate, to identify a network motif, first we have to calculate the, um, uh, for a random network, what is the, probably to find a particular um, age or a particular motif. Any questions? Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, uh, suppose I uh, have some experimentally determined network in front of me. I count total number of nodes and total number of edges, N and E. Then I create a random network. Namely, I put N nodes and randomly connect them with E edges. And now I will calculate how many times that particular structure occurs in that random network. If that number is significantly lower than the number of times that structure occurs in the actual network, actual by uh, physical some building block. It could, yeah, I mean, it could be some, <laughs> sorry? Okay, is that called overlap? 
I, I, I don't know. I mean, oh, maybe. No, 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 not necessarily, because I am looking for one particular pattern. So let's say I can think of it triangle, suppose a triangle, or even a two-node pattern, or even a one-node pattern, as he asked the question, that one, there can be self-edges, one node can be created, uh, one edge can be created and, uh, I mean, starting and ending at the same node. And then I will, suppose that is a self-edge, and I see in an E. coli, there is lo large number of self-edges. In fact, there is 40 self-edges. Then I create a random network, and I count how many self-edges do I have. And if that number is much, much less than 40, then it is not uh, appearing because of randomness. There is another clear advantage of having that structure. Is that okay? Okay. Sorry? No, it is not no, so no. much of a coarse graining because, as I said, it can be even a self edge. Yeah, but it's like you're ignoring all together, sitting at one edge. Oh, right, right, yes. I imagine, yeah, th that's right, yeah. So <coughs> you're asking whether that whatever particular structure is due to randomness or it's due to something else? Yes. If it is, suppose, if the frequencies are of the same order, then it is not, I don't call it a network motif. Okay. Then it is appearing at random, it will, maybe I wait for some time, it may go away, or I mean, something like that. But if I, there is a clearly large difference between a random uh, frequency and actual observed frequency, then I have to take it seriously, that I am finding it too often. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, there could be many random types of random graphs. There could be? Many types of random graphs. Yeah, yeah. I am talking about only this particular one. No, this is what I compare it with. Oh, you want to compare it with? Yes. There can be different types, but I am talking about this specific type where I keep the nodes and edges same, and I assign the edges at random between two pairs, between a pair. But uh, to make this conclusion that other uh, systems also are showing this kind of... Uh, I'm not making that conclusion. I'm observing that. Yeah, yeah. Observing I'm experimentally that? observing that pattern is being repeated many, many times. Uh, okay. Uh, what I'm just trying to ask is, there could be other models where uh, your random matrix or sorry, random graph might be different in a sense. It might not be either shiny, it could be something else. In that case, you might have different kinds of yeah, It is possible. It is possible. Yeah. But here, we, what we call network motive is we uh, compare it with only uh, that kind of a random graph. Is there a reason why this is That I don't know, actually. Okay. If maybe this is the simplest one. That is why it is taken. I don't know. But I... Uh, I think even if you have some, I don't know this for sure, I have not done it myself, but even if you define the random graph from some other algorithm, it may not be an order of magnitude different if you count the frequency of one particular building block appearing. Okay, I, I think so, but I have not done it myself, but I, I would think so. Okay? <clears throat> yes. Sorry? Uh, we are looking at structural similarity. Only with respect to one particular pattern. As Ovishek pointed out, we are right. not, we are, suppose I am interested in the self edges. Right. I don't care then all the other edges which are present. I am only focusing on the self edge and looking for how many self edges are there in the random network versus how many self edges are there in the actually, actual biologically <coughs> relevant physical network. Uh, self edge is as an I don't understand. Self edge is when an edge yeah. begins and ends at the same node. <coughs> this means a gene, uh, he asked a question, a gene is auto-regulating. Auto -reg right. So the product of a gene acts as its own transcription factor. <coughs> okay, uh, so my doubt is like if I, ha let's say I have three loops in the, uh, like three self loops in the first. I network. have three? Self loops, a as in like the auto regulation. Right. And then after deleting edges uh, and after doing all these random things, I have three self loops again, but at different sites, like uh, three different auto regulation genes. And now, can I call these two networks as no. the same? Okay. Uh, because yeah. if, if it is also three, if it is three also, then uh, it is not a network motive. So it's not just about the structural similarity, right? So also I, about yeah, the it, site I'm not also. caring where it is occurring. Right. I mean, okay, I mean, th that is an important information. Yes. But this analysis is far simpler than that. 
this analysis is, I mean, as I said, that this is a very general, some of the general principles which I wanted to explain. Right. Okay. So here I would just take the whole, I don't care what is where, just count how many such patterns are there. Because right. that is the first thing I observed. Right. That uh, quite a few self-edges, let's look at a random work, almost none, or maybe one or two. Then uh, there is a reason. Then study the self-edges. What are their advantages? Okay. Okay? Thank you. Ma'am. Many? Scale for 10. Uh, the number of nodes, so let's say at the scale of 1 node, 2 node, 10 nodes. Uh, yeah, node, nodes. here n, n is the number of nodes in the whole network, uh, whole transcription is. network, which is experimentally given to me. I am not playing but with those numbers. we are looking numbers. at patterns at particular scale. Pa a pattern may involve different type. For example, a self edge involves only one node. Right. <coughs> there can be another network motif which involves only two nodes. Three nodes, four nodes. I will describe those cases one by one. So when we have, when we are looking at patterns of smaller scale, uh, I mean smaller n, at at a smaller scale, how confidently can we look at these motifs? What do you mean by smaller scale? I mean motif consisting of smaller number of, smaller nodes. Number of nodes. Yeah, that is uh, because motifs refer to basic building blocks. Okay, so uh, I mean I, I'm defining them like that. If there is two, okay, so let me just maybe do, do, do the analysis for one case, then you will see. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> I have n nodes and e edges. So for a random network, for a random network, I have um, n, n minus 1 by 2 number of pairs. Okay, those, and so therefore you can put in principle, this many edges. This, these are the number of pairs. And those pairs can be, pairs are directed. <coughs> X controls Y, not the other way around. So how many ways can you put directed edge between N nodes? That is N, N times N minus 1. Plus there are some self edges which are possible, plus N. So therefore, there is a total number of N square edges you can put. And then you put E edges at random. So the probability that one particular edge is observed in a random network is E by N square. Hmm? <clears throat> okay. Now I would like to identify one particular network motif which is called negative autoregulation. First, let us see how many self, uh, self edges do you expect in a random network. So there are, if there are n nodes, then 1 by n is the probability to form a self edge. There are n nodes, any one of them can have it. And then E by n would be the average number of self edges you expect in a random network. Now I will put in the numbers for an E. coli cell, n is 424 and E is 519. If you put it here, expected number of self edge comes out to be 1.2. Now go back to an actual E. coli network, you find 40 self edges out of which 34 are of negative autoregulation type. So there are two types of self edge interaction possible. Product of a gene acts as its own transcription factor. Now it could be an activation type of uh, control or it could be a repressor type of control. If a gene is producing a protein which in turn enhance its own production, it is called a positive autoregulation. If it is <coughs> Inhibiting its own production, it is called a negative autoregulation. For E. coli, there is 34, 34 is a much larger number compared to 
So therefore, negative autoregulation is a strong network motif. Now next, we will try to understand why. Any questions? Yes. How many realizations you take for random network for comparison? Here, uh, we could uh, do the comp uh, comparison exactly, do the computation exactly. But okay. for, um, I mean, larger number of realizations you take, better it will be. No, that because is it is its own transcription factor. So, but it's, it's repressing it. So, the question is in... Uh, if, if it is repressing it, that would mean the transcription will happen if and only if that uh, binding site is empty. Okay, okay. Okay. So uh, now that we have established, anybody has any question about why aut negative autocorrelation is considered to be a motif? Uh, Ma'am, one question. On yes. No. <coughs> Ma'am, one question on uh, the, num uh, the number of uh, self-regulated uh, uh, yes. edges. So uh, I, I can't understand why that's E by N. I mean, there are N number of nodes. So if, if I can just connect one node to itself, then there will be one by N. Uh, that is one by N, and then I have to put E edges in that network. But, uh, but then, then we are not talking about self-regulating uh, edges, are we? No, no. I mean, what is the probability that an edge, if of the order, if, if is a self-edge? That is 1 over n. n nodes, yes. what is the probability that an edge is a self-edge? 1 over n. Yes. Each node can have a self-edge. Yes. And now, what is the total number of edges you have? Multiply that with the probability that will give you an expected number of self edges in the system. Any other question? Okay, so now next we would like to calculate the. Sorry, what time is it? I have half an hour more, right? Yeah. So next I would like to calculate what is the advantage or uh, study what is the advantage of this negative autoregulation. So as we will see, um, for example, compared to a simple <coughs> negative autocorrelation, autoregulation is written like this, x with a negative sign. This is typically, uh, this is how it is rep represented. So um, uh, we will uh, see that response time for this particular type of regulation is much shorter than a simple regulation. So first I will compute the response time for a simple, simply regulated gene, compare it with the response time for a negative autoregulated gene and see the advantage. So first response time for a simply regulated gene. So X, let's say it's an activation type of X activates Y. So this means when a signal when a signal SX appears, X goes to X star, and there is this step function type of interaction, and Y is produced. So uh, I am interested in writing down the time evolution equation for y concentration dy dt. <coughs> I assume that as soon as the signal comes, immediately this happens, which is reasonable because it is of the order of milliseconds. And then also it immediately comes and binds to the uh, promoter uh, region of y such that the um, concentration x star very quickly, almost immediately, crosses its activation threshold. So the production process happens at the maximal rate beta. And then there is this other term, which is 
decreasing the concentration of Y. What are the biological processes which can decrease a protein concentration? One is degradation. After being formed, a protein has only finite lifetime. It degrades away. Secondly, a cell can grow. And when, it's when it is growing, its volume is going up. So the concentration of a protein can go down. And this alpha actually com contains both the terms, alpha degradation plus alpha dilution. <coughs> and in the steady state, I have yst. In the steady state, it is dy dt 0, so y steady is beta by alpha. So if you plot this, um, solve this equation, yt comes out to be y steady times 1 minus e to the minus alpha times t. <coughs> Response time is um, defined as the amount of time it needs to reach the half of its steady state value. So y t half is equal to y s t over t over 2. Hmm? So if you put it in this equation, then it is just one line algebra and you can show, everybody can see if I write it at this level, I will not go below this. So t half is log 2 by alpha. This is the response time for a simply regulated gene. Note that it does not contain beta. One might expect that if, we, okay, if the production rate is high, then uh, my half time will be uh, lower. But the thing is higher production rate also pushes up the <coughs> steady state level, which you need to reach. So anyway, so this is T half, this is log 2 by alpha. And now I will compute the same thing for, a, uh, for the case of negative autoregulation. <coughs> Yes. Yes. Then I assumed that the Hill coefficient is infinitely large, and I replaced it with the with the theta function. Yes. So where does the theta function doesn't appear here? Yeah, that, that is that is what I said. That I assume that this happens so fast that X star very quickly crosses that threshold. Okay. So. Okay, because you see, I am considering x goes to y. I am not talking about production of x. A apparently, x was already there in its inactive okay. form. Signal comes and binds to it, and it quickly becomes active. That process is very fast. Okay. And I am assuming it almost immediately uh, crosses the threshold. So, and this alpha is of the order of our uh, alpha uh, value. Uh, the no, time scale, you said there were two time scales, right? Millisecond and then one. This hour. this t half is of the order of hours. Oh, okay. Yes, <coughs> right. Yes. Sorry, say it again. Y at y at time t is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. That we are taking the previous formula it gave in terms of the step function, right? Yes. Beta into step function of. Yes, yes. So that's where we start this particular experiment, whatever it is. We start at where? We start observing this thing degradation. Uh, Decaying of protein uh, concentration. Decaying due of to protein is always there. No, uh, I mean uh, decaying of protein concentration in a cell due to all these factors. No, decay of protein mm. concentration is one is due to degradation, another is due to dilution. Huh. So this is the reason why we have an alpha here. Yeah, but to start with, we say that the initial concentration was uh, beta. B uh, beta the into initial rate function. of production was beta. Okay. The reason we said that is because we assume X star crosses its threshold, activation threshold, let's say K, almost immediately. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Next, we will show that negative autoregulation speeds up response. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, Tell me. If... Uh, that process was not fast, there would have been another equation for uh, x also, right? That's right. And there will be a beta times f multiplied to if the... If I am, as we will see here, oh, okay. that if I am, uh, because here my transcription factor is my own product. 
So here I cannot assume that x immediately crosses the threshold. As you will see here, here I cannot afford to <coughs> use that. But there I could do that because I assumed I am not considering x production. I am only considering this. So apparently x was already there in its inactive form, then the input signal comes. And then the switching of all the x to x star or a suitable fraction of it to x star is very fast. Okay, so for negative autoregulation, I instead write this equation dx dt is equal to fx minus alpha x. Here I do not cannot assume that x all quickly crosses its because x was not there, it is being produced, right. <coughs> so this fx is uh, what kind of hill function will it be, uh, decreasing or increasing, anybody? Decreasing, why? Louder, why? Negative, Negative very good. So therefore, fx uh, has the form beta by 1 plus x by k or x, uh, x by k whole to the n. But um, I will, uh, huh. so now if x is much, so this will be like a st uh, step function. If x is much, much less than k, then the promoter is free. If the promoter is free, then uh, it is, uh, the production is going ahead at full steam because it is a rep repression type of interaction. If it is below the threshold, so x is starting from the, its building up. When it is below this threshold, the promoter is free and <coughs> therefore uh, fx can be written as sorry, fx becomes equal to beta. So, I get um, dx dt is equal to beta minus alpha x provided x is less than k. In fact, if x is very small to start with for small times, I can even neglect this term. So, then it is ballistically increasing very fast. But then it slows down and far particularly when it is reaches the x level, when it reaches the concentration k, then the um, step function flips. So then the production immediately stops, right? If the production stops, then under the action of this degradation term, uh, this, um, uh, dec uh, this term, the concentration will drop. But as soon as the concentration drops below k, production picks up again. So therefore, if I plot alpha t as a function of x t by k, I find this type of a curve. Initially, it is almost linear when I could neglect this term. Then perhaps I include this term, it slows down slightly. And then it is, it just locks itself at the steady state value, okay? If it tries to fall below it, then immediately it gets pushed up. So the response time for this case, t half is <coughs> k by 2 beta. And if I now want to compare this response time with um, this one, these are two different processes. Notice one thing that here the response time depends on the activation threshold and it depends on the, um, the production rate beta. So if I want to compare these two processes, let me make sure that the steady state level are same in the two cases. And then I will ask the question, how long do I need to reach 50% of that level? <coughs> and um, I also assume that the degradation rate, the alpha is same for both the cases. This is just for the purpose of uh, comparing. And then I get um, T half auto divided by T half simple regulation is equal to beta simple by beta divided by 2 log 2. 
you can increase beta as much as you want and you can decrease this um, half time by a significant amount. Another thing is, another advantage of, this is one advantage, the response is faster, it speeds up the response. Another advantage is, in the simple regulation, the steady state value is beta by alpha, okay? Now, this beta, alpha, these are parameters which are subject to, this is a biological fact, I'm not justifying it, I'm just stating it. It is observed that these parameters are subject to cell-cell fluctuations. But the activation threshold K is a robust quantity. Because you see, activation threshold tells you at what time this circuit flips. And that is, that you cannot play with. I mean, if that is changing, if that is fluctuating, then the system stops functioning optimally. So here, the steady state depends on the activation uh, threshold, which is, uh, <coughs> sorry, x steady. This, uh, the steady state value depends on the activation threshold, which is a robust quantity. So what I was trying to say, another advantage of negative autoregulation is it um, uh, helps the system to become robust against cell-cell fluctuations. So this is the response for a negative, uh, yeah, sorry. Huh. So this we did it for uh, simple, uh, for step function type of things. Even if you actually um, use this type of function, you can still show that um, it still speeds up response. <coughs> Similar to this, positive autocorrelation actually slows down the response. Negative autocorrelation, just I said, it speeds up the response. Positive autocorrelation, uh, autoregulation slows it down. And um, the, um, that is sometimes it helps because um, as we will see later, in some developmental processes, when signals are delayed, then are, I mean, okay, okay, maybe I, I mean, sometimes a delay is good. Sometimes a delayed response is good, particularly when um, cell division, etc. This type, this type of things happen, and for those cases, positive autoregulation loops are found. But um, for E. coli, mostly it is uh, negative autoregulation. Um, okay. Any question? Is it going too fast? Too slow? Yes. Yes, that's what I said, that beta, alpha, these parameters, they are subject, it, it is seen that they can fluctuate from cell to cell, both are beta and alpha. I am putting them same. I'm I'm, I want to compare these two half-lives, uh, these uh, response times. So I'm putting the steady state concentration same for both the cases. So in that case, that positive auto regulation should be faster, it should be faster. No, pos no, actually that doesn't happen because um, um, for positive auto regulation, the curve is slower than um, the simple regulation. I mean, it creates is, um, sorry, I, Yes. You could think about other functions. I could? You could think about other functions which show the same behavior. Is that in terms of the Hill curve? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, this is an experimental input. People have seen that these type of functions are satisfactorily fitting the experimental data. That is the reason. Yes. Why are we looking at this half-life sort of time? It is just we define that. Because response time we define like that. How long does it need to reach 50% of its final value? Yeah, but that, so, that makes sense more when we have sort of exponential type of things where half-life is a relevant quantity. But if we have like this sort of ballistic... No, why? Even here it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. I mean, we are looking at how long does it take to reach 50% of your value. But why that is, not how you are that is how you are defining it. I mean, okay, maybe, maybe we, we could use some other definition also, but. Um. 
any other questions uh, why is half life not dependent on n n yeah n oh, n actually we are using n goes to infinity here because all these um, calculations i did for the step function okay. but uh, in principle there will be in principle it may depend yes <coughs> How long do I have here? Have five minutes? Five or ten? Ten. ten okay. After this, I wanted to consider the next network motif, which is called a feed-forward loop. I will not be able to finish the whole thing today, but um, I will continue tomorrow. Let me just introduce it <coughs> today. So. Uh, this negative autoregulation is a single uh, self-edge uh, thing, cons uh, involves only one node. Feed-forward loop consists of three nodes. Now, there are many different structures which you can make out of three nodes. For example, you could have this one regulates this and this. Sometimes you can have this, this one regulates this and being regulated by this. Various different types of such and sometimes it can even be two ways. So uh, this one regulates this but there are two links here. Sometimes you can form a loop. In, I mean, you can make various such um, uh, small um, uh, subgraphs. And the feed forward, and out of all these, only one is actually <coughs> considered a network motif. Because if you look at its frequency, it is much more than what you would expect from a random consideration. That is called a three node feed forward loop. node feed forward loop and it is given by x z y so x regulates y and it regulates z and y regulates z this is three node feed forward loop and it is also possible to have three node feedback loop That is x, y, z, x, z, y. Here x regulates z, z regulates y, and y regulates x. <coughs> so if you calculate from a random graph, what is the x? the expected number of times you encounter this loop or this loop, then um, feed forward loop on an average random, uh, on an average the number is expected to be about 1.7 and for feedback loop the number is about 0.6. Now go back to E. coli network, count how many feed forward loop you will have. For an E. coli network, you have 42 number of feed forward loops and you have zero feedback loop, no feedback loop at all. So feed forward loop, three node feed forward loop is a very strong network motif. So next we will look into what is its advantage. So maybe I will uh, start on that topic tomorrow, okay?
same number of nodes as E. coli and same number of edges, yes. Directed graph, yes. Have this, yes. And that I actually I did not check it myself. I just <laughs> took the number, but uh, I, I don't think it will be very difficult to do. Um, yeah, so yes, yes, it is an analytic calculation. Yes, it should be easy to do. I did not do it myself. Yeah. Any other questions? <sighs> yes. Hmm? The simple auto regulation is same, right? When x is no, less than k. No, it's not same. When n is infinity, let's say, when they're very large. When uh, here n did not come into picture, isn't but it? The equation okay, is n, same. small n, small n is infinity. Small yes, n, small yes, n, yeah. yes. Then the equations are same. The no, equations are not same. Why not? Equations are same. You see, they they are the equation for the for the simple or simple regulation. This equation was true for always, but here it is true subject to this condition that when x is less than k, as soon as x touches k, this term goes away, no production. Okay, uh, okay so we, uh, we do the calculation exactly, then the k by 2 beta will come, is that what you're saying? Because, uh, yeah, no, uh, no, so it is easy, right, I mean, the steady state value is k because it, if it is touching k then it is to the, it is stopping and then if it is falling below k then it is pushed back to k so this is the steady state value and then you ask how long do you need to reach k by 2 and uh, it, here i think i have neglected this term i have assumed that it is just it was growing linearly and k by 2 better okay. And it, it, I mean, you could, you don't have to do this if you don't like it. You can also include this term and do something better than that. This will perhaps change this thing a bit, but it will continue to remain true that it is still much faster. And most importantly, you can continue to make it better and better by choosing better, by choosing a good promoter. It's called a, if it is in presence of this, if it is a good, um, what should I say, a good enhancement of protein production rate then it is, um, you can choose beta in, to be as large as you want and you can make it much more advantageous compared to single regulation. Okay, then let's stop for today. <coughs> Yeah, just a quick announcement. Uh, okay, so we'll have uh, tutorials from 4.30. And uh, so I have uploaded uh, some lecture notes, uh, okay, lecture notes by Professor Spoon and Sitabra uh, in the con uh, this school web page. So as you know that there are two web pages, one is from ICTS and one is from RRI. Uh, in the limit t going to infinity, both the information in that, uh, both the web pages will be same, but at the time scale of hours, maybe there might be some discrepancy. Maybe just look at both the web pages and you just go to the web page and then there's a link called talks and then uh, the material will be linked from there basically. So today's materials are linked from there and probably it will be also linked from there. No, but there, yeah, if okay. there are two different materials yeah. in the two different web pages, which one they are going to follow? No, no, no. <laughs> Material will be the same, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the synchronization will might take time. So that's the, the time scale of hours, maybe or minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Tutorial. So t today maybe we'll have uh, you and Her Herbert uh, for the, so uh, Shokundala, maybe you can take the tutorial tomorrow. Okay. So today uh, I think uh, Herbert and. 
Actually, I uh, don't. So I haven't planned any tutorial. If uh, they have any questions, yeah. I'll be so happy if to people answer. have basically tutorial means if people have questions, uh, doubts to clear, they clear. And if you have, if you want to give problems, that's also uh, fine. Uh, I'll be here tomorrow morning. If people have doubts about anything, I can also, uh, like, uh, so I'll be here from 8.45 onwards. So if people have any doubts, I can try to.